being here and we'd like to I need to start with a motion to approve the consent calendar motion to approve second. I have a motion and a second is there any discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. those opposed no and the motion carries now it is my privilege to turn the instruction portion of the agenda over to Ms. Rowletter. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <laughs> I think we're going to begin here with um, item 2.02, .02, Innovative Courses. Uh, Dr. Royster. Good morning, thank you. Uh, Mr. McCoy has a, I believe, brief presentation and then we'll answer any questions that you might have about innovative courses. Uh, this is the, uh, I guess, the annual presentation of uh, innovative courses. Is that, isn't that correct, Mr. McCoy? Yes, sir. Um, I don't necessarily have a presentation um, for you. I think you've got the course list um, in the um, board agenda. I will just remind you that the um, last year the State Board of Education approved it with through the UGP other courses to be eligible for honors level um, in the past we were not allowed to have anything other than core honors level at the le first level one and two um, they opened that up in the UGP to allow other courses to have honors designation at the one and uh, first and second level of courses so most of what you see here is that um, the teachers have been working very hard um, to create those honors level courses that's why the package you've got something hundred and some of the pages I think it is it's a lot um, but that is following the state rubric that's required in order to turn a course into honors level so everything you have in front of you is the majority of these courses are all due to the state's change in UGP um, and we've got another 20 or 30 of those in the works over the okay. next year that we will bring to you is that it that was it excellent any questions dr ball o'connor yes thank you jeff um it was exciting to see these um, opportunities especially for the first time i think with project lead the way and some of the career and technology mm -hmm. um, track courses that have been now given their proper elevation to be able to say this work adds academic value to the same level that others do um, but I would ask you just to you know you mentioned the rubric I understand that the rubric is tough to meet but I would like for you just to talk a little bit about um, the rigor to make sure that these are elevated not in name only but um, in the way that the others have been over time just help sure. think through the rubric a little bit well the rubric is different for every level of course so every subject level has their own rubric if you will um, many, most of the common elements across those rubrics for example is that students have to keep a portfolio we have to keep uh, samples and evidence of student work now those you won't see in the pack that you have of course because these courses don't exist yet so we don't have those artifacts so mm -hmm. this first year is really the how the teachers are going to collect that information we will be collecting that information over the course of the year because we do have to have that on file for the State Department audits um, in there. So one of the reasons you only see however many courses this is, like I said, we probably got another 20 in the works um, right now. Some of those courses originally, when the teachers looked at them and my team looked at them, they did not feel like they could meet the rigor of the honors rubric requirement for those courses. So some courses have already been determined we cannot make honors courses. Um, the others, um, are just going to take a little bit longer time to create as honors because they're not really sure how to do portfolios for some of those courses they're not really sure how to create the, the rigor of assessments for those portfolios so they'll either determine at that point there's a way to do that and create those or they'll determine that that course is not going to be eligible for honors requirements anymore okay and I thought we already had um, Spanish honors in seventh and eighth grade at, at the town center at, at least um, we do have the this we have the Spanish um, yes we have the Spanish one honors and Spanish uh, two honors we did not have I'm sorry we had the Spanish one um, these are immersion courses the ones at Hughes and Greenville middle the ones that you're now referring to as 
honors are the immersion. Correct. These French immersion, Spanish immersion, those are those have always those have always been C P level, non honors level. Okay. And where are we offering those other than Hughes? In Hughes Green and Greenville Middle. Hughes and Greenville Middle. Okay. Um, the next question I have is is there any effort at looking toward honors level waiting for ROTC in the higher elevations of those classes? Yes, that one is one that's on the list. Um, that was one of the ones they're having a little hard time meeting the rubric at this point in time. And so that team is going to take a little longer to research it. Um, just under the timeline, they did not feel like they could meet the honors rubric um, with those courses. So I think Melissa Patterson's leading that team. Um, she's got a team of some of those teachers um, that are leading that to hopefully in the fall bring that towards you for you in October. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Suddeth, next on the list. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Mr. McCoy, yes, I'm sir. looking at the French immersion that will be in six, seven, and eight. Yes, sir. And it says this course is taught entirely in French. Yes, sir. So this is for those that are coming from Blythe Academy? Yes, sir. If I wish to take that and I come from another school, it says I have to, a, a language proficiency assessment. Yes. What exactly is that? It would, that, that is an assessment just to gauge the level of proficiency a student has as far as readiness goes um, for those courses. So for example, there is other French immersion um, schools in the state. And so you may have a child that might transfer to Greenville, has been in another immersion school. And so just to make sure they're actually prepared for the, for the rigor of that class all being taught in French, they would provide them with a proficiency test, if you will. And if they meet a certain score on that test, then they would be eligible to go into that class. What's our goal presently on foreign languages in middle school? I notice we've got Spanish. I notice we've got French. Are we going to add other courses, other languages to that? Well, right now, uh, Mr. Sutter, those are the only two languages we teach in middle school. Um, part of our dilemma is um, finding foreign language teachers, um, even in those courses right now. Um, we've always, we've taught a couple more high, uh, foreign language courses at the high school level, but we're currently struggling at the high school level to find, we've got several foreign language vacancies right now at the high school level. Um, and so finding those foreign language teachers is very difficult. So Spanish we, and French is our focus right now. We've got French at six, seven, and eight. In certain schools, yes, sir. And we have got Spanish in sixth, seventh, and eighth. Yes, and Spanish is our is our more prevalent language um, mm -hmm. in middle school. But these courses are very limited, depending upon the student, unless they came from Blythe Academy. Yes, yeah, so sir. These the the immersion courses are only taught at Hughes and um, Greenville Middle. Repeat where, Mr. Uh, Hughes, Hughes Academy and Greenville Middle Academy. Okay. And these other courses that we're talking about here, are we, are we getting more and more students into biomedical engineering that we've decided we need to add honors to that as well as the mechanical and aerospace engineering? Yes, sir. The, um, the, when we put this out to the schools um, for the honors rubric, we did not, as an academics team, decide which courses we were going to turn into honors. Um, we have certain ones on a list we believe we need to turn into honors, but we put that out to the schools first as far as the demand goes and what they felt like they have demand and asking from students for courses. And so the medical, as you know, health science is one of our, the, the biggest career fields, of course, across all our high schools when um, Brooks does his um, career assessments and the IGP meetings at the end of the year, that data shows that health science is one of our largest fields across the um, high school um, platform, so, or high schools rather. So um, that's, the biomedical engineering is a, big, is a big one in our schools, the health field, I should say. Refresh my mind, honors course, does that give us a, a student a higher GPR? Yes, sir, it does. Okay, it's that's all I have. Thank you. Um, Ms. Goodwin Cowell. Jeff, what 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 schools are these? I I don't need I, I don't see the names of the schools that where these are going to be offered. 
No, ma'am, because I would not know which schools they're going to be offered at. These are the schools that certainly the teachers that are working on these courses are coming from multiple schools. But once a course is approved by the board for local board approval, any school in the district can offer that course. It's not school specific. Okay, so the, the um, teachers that um, applied for these courses, they'll be what lead teachers going to the other schools that well want them or how no, would no. that work they the, the teachers that asked for these and really the school principals are the ones that requested the courses to be in the honors we didn't ask the, the job of the principal was to ask the teachers when we sent out the survey as far as what courses do we need to look at making honors courses first so do you have that list of schools that ask for honors courses yes because um you know I know some schools ask for it, but what about the schools that don't ask for it that is not um, available at those schools? Will well, the students be able to leave their schools to go to another school well, to the, take these courses if well, it's not offered at their school? Well, these courses can be offered at any school, but it'd be unlike, it wouldn't be any different than any other courses in the state catalog. I know you say it can be correct offered, but if it's not offered at a school where a child wants to take the course, would they be able to attend another school to take the course? I mean, students would have to apply for choice to go to that school. So they would have to apply to go to the school in order to take. Unless there was. Like if it's just one course that they want to take. Unless it's We a, don't. If we do, do unless it's a situation like I can give you an example, like Blue Ridge High and Greer High. Sometimes there's courses AP specifically that Greer may not offer that Blue Ridge does. And because those schools are within close proximity to each other, or let's say Riverside and Greer, certainly we have made arrangements for students to, sh to drive or get to those schools to take those courses. But what yes. if it's not in close proximity? Well, what, would, what, what would they do? I mean, if their school is not offering this course and it's something that they want to take, how would we? If, it, if, for example, a child at Blue Ridge wanted to take a course that was only offered at Woodmont, they would have to apply to Choice to Woodmont. Okay. There's, there's basically three ways they can do that. If it's available virtually, they can take it virtually. If they can work out the time in their schedule, the time and the distance to get there, they can do that. And they have to work that out between the two schools. Or the third way is they can apply for choice. Are these courses going to be um, available virtual? Some of them might be. Some are. Some, the art courses are very difficult to do virtual. Um, we have some courses but certainly available, but are others certainly yes. We. Greenville County is actually one of the only ones, the state virtual does not do honors level courses, but Greenville <coughs> County does. So we have actually a lot of honors courses available to students, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ball O'Connor? Yes, I just wanted to go back for just a second, Jeff, to the um, Spanish. I think you said those were for immersion, but with the French you list honors French and immersion French and here we only have Spanish honors which, which, which I you, thought we already had which um, one are you referring to specifically Spanish honors and you said you thought those related to immersion the ones that have immersion let's see Spanish honors so you have both for for French um, just honors French and immersion French correct but the, when I asked I said I thought we already had Spanish honors in middle school and you said this relates to immersion but it's not in the definition in those particular the yes if you're referring to Spanish language arts eighth honors that is an immersion language arts class for Spanish okay I'm just curious about why the distinction is different when you call it French immersion versus span not referring to immersion is that because all span spanish honors level are immersive in nature um the only two that are outside that are spanish one we, the other course are span the one that general any child could take would be spanish one or spanish one honors or spanish two spanish two honors these are specific to the actual hughes and greenville middle so when you see French Immersion Social Studies 6, French Immersion Social Studies 8, those would be exclusive right now to Greenville Middle. Okay. Um, it's, it's all right. It was, it was just really a distinction between Spanish and French that isn't, isn't clear to me here, but I'll ask you about it 
again okay. later. Jeff, I think the the issue, if I'm it's understanding this correctly, on the list you have Spanish language arts honors. Yeah, instead of immersion. Spanish language arts eighth honors and seventh. Right. Is it simply that's the same thing? Yeah, some of these courses we kept the same original titles as the CP level courses, um, and so those you know those were built over the course of six or seven years, and so that's why if you're asking about the matching of courses, yes. we can go back and change the names. I, I think just, it would be better to make the names consistent. Yeah. I believe they're they're the same thing in two different subject areas: one in language arts, they are, one in social studies, and a student in the seventh or eighth grade taking Spanish or French, not immersion, taking Correct. Spanish or French, they'd be taking Spanish one. Or French one just like the high school course right. so it wouldn't be any distinction it would be honored simply because it's being taught at the middle, middle school, school level. level correct okay that that was it really just the, the clarifying the, the, the terminology is not terminology. consistent but the courses correct okay the courses themselves are and then this is not on here but it just gives me a reminder to say to you it would be lovely if anyone is looking at coding or technology related or computer and technology related courses that we might see here yes. in that upcoming list. So. And we would agree with you. We're waiting, um, as you probably know, we're waiting on the state to determine what counts for computer science credit now. Um, so we had some of those on the list to determine, but the teachers decided they did not want to create honors level classes until we figure out what the state was going to do first. Gotcha. And then they'll create the honors level. Thank you. Is that it? Ms. Morrison Fair. Jeff, I have a simple question. Okay. Um, are students who are not in honors allowed to audit any of these courses? Yeah, they can. They can audit any course. Um, again, they can't take it later um, for this for credit, but they can audit any of these courses as long as they're not going to take it for credit later. Absolutely. Thank you. Is that all? Yes. Would anybody else like to speak? Then I will turn the, excuse me, uh, Mr. Suddeth has requested another turn. Yes, sir, Mr. Suddeth. There's time about, uh, oh, we've got five minutes. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll do that for Mr. McCoy. Yes, sir. As you know, I'm, I'm a proponent of Latin. Yes, sir. And it, it's, it's we, to the point where we're saying that Latin is a lost <laughs> art yes sir that colleges are no longer going to teach it and so therefore because colleges aren't then we aren't I'm just asking your opinion I'm not saying well I've never heard the college yes sir what I would say to that is that we if you look at our court the this high schools that offered Latin the reasons they're not offering Latin right now is because they couldn't get the students enrolling into that those courses I have to look. I don't remember if Greenville High is still teaching Latin. Um, I believe they are. That was the one school because they're a law school, um, and that's very prevalent in the law courses in college. That Latin, those Latin stems and Latin language, they were still teaching that. Um, one of the problems we had though is when the teachers were retiring that taught Latin, we could not replace them because there were no Latin teachers to replace them with, and so those those courses naturally died at those schools because they couldn't find the kids to take them and they couldn't find the teachers to teach them. It's a shame that it died because I think Latin is an excellent way to teach English. We're, we're, we're talking about Spanish, we're talking about French, but the language we're all supposed to be uh, using is English, but yet we're not going to do the things that teach that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Coyne. Does anybody else need to speak? If not, then I'll turn the gavel back over to Dr. O'Connor. There, there is a recommended motion from the Excuse me, I will grab the gavel back then. Um, the, uh, is there a recommended, there's a recommended motion from the administration to approve the local board courses as presented um, yes. I make a motion that we approve the local co board courses as presented. Second. Yep. 
Is there a second? Yes. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And the motion carries. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rowletter. It is now my privilege to turn the gavel to Ms. Grayson for the administration portion of our agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item 3.01, school security. There is a public and executive session component to this, and at this time I'll call on the administration to present the public portion. Thank you, Ms. Grayson. This uh, presentation comes as a request from uh, Mr. Sailors and Mr. Lewis. I believe, unfortunately, Mr. Lewis is, is out today uh, with illness. Uh, but uh, what we hope to provide to you this morning is a comprehensive presentation uh, predominantly in the open session with a part of it in executive session as you referenced uh, some items directly related to how we maintain security for our students staff and facilities is not information that we want to disclose to the public but the larger uh, bulk of the presentation uh, is in the public session and uh, I believe Mr. Owens is going to lead that and uh, assisted by uh, uh, Mr. Sheely and Lieutenant Reinhardt and maybe some other individuals uh, as they approach the podium. This is obviously a very timely topic. It's a topic that we all have uh, great interest in and concern for. We have for many years had a very comprehensive plan in Greenville County Schools to help to ensure that our students our staff, our faculty, and our facilities are safe as they can possibly be. Uh, we have made numerous changes along the way. We frequently make changes during the course of a year, uh, reinforcing the plan. Anytime there's an incidence of significance that occurs, whether it occurs in Greenville County, somewhere else in South Carolina, or somewhere else in the nation, we revisit our plan to see what lessons might be learned from those occurrences how we might strengthen that plan. And this latest incident in Florida is no exception to that. We have already done considerable review of our plan. We've made some uh, alterations to it. We believe strengthening that plan. Uh, as time goes by and is an objective, as an objective review of what happened in Florida takes place, uh, we know that we will likely learn more about what uh, perhaps went well there. If there are things that did not go well there, we will learn those too, and we will apply those in, uh, in revising our plan as we need to do. Uh, so at this time, I'd like Mr. Owens to uh, start the presentation. Uh, we'll try to go through the entire thing. If you have questions at the end, we'll certainly answer all those questions. Uh, it, it's Perhaps possible you may ask a question that we would defer to the executive session and, and we would say that at the time. Uh, but uh, Mr. Owens. Morning. Good morning. Morning. I want to try to give you an overview of how we plan for and provide for the safety and security of all of our students and all of our staffs throughout the district. I think you'll see as we go through the presentation that even though school, school security and safety falls within my department, it's a concentrated, coordinated, collaborative effort amongst many different departments within the district, also external and many different people within the district. And that's necessary for us to attain the standards that you, we, and our community expect as we try to provide the safest environment as we can for all of our students and all of our em employees. I'll try, to, as we go through, because of that coordination, there'll be some areas that overlap, some things I speak of, Dr. Royster mentioned already. But I want to focus on some key positions that are involved in determining, implementing, and monitoring um, our security protocols. We'll look at our district emergency response plan, how we partner with law enforcement and other community agencies. Also want to look at how we coordinate or integrate technology, facilities, and uh, maintenance into the overall security plan. We'll talk about some training and um, equipment initiatives that we use to try to help make our schools as safe as we possibly can. The personnel, as you see, Wade Sheely, and Wade is here, retired law enforcement, uh, worked with emergency management, is our coordinator of, coordinator of school safety and emergency preparedness. Uh, he was an investigator for violent crimes. 
uh, he works directly under me. Randy Evitt is beside Wade. He is retired from the county and as a lieutenant from the city, taught three years at Greenville Tech. Uh, he manages the Raptor volunteer process and assists Wade with the security process. Between them, they've got over 59 years law enforcement experience. In technology, we have three certified ETS technology uh, technicians. They've got over 56 years of law enforcement experience. They conduct an average of 260 internet safety programs each year, um, over 780 programs as you'll see. Um, they do a lot of monitoring of social media, a lot of the issues that we get with, uh, you know, that's where they originate. And also, several years ago, and we'll get into the district emergency response plan in a minute, Wade wrote that plan, uh, then applied for a RIMS grant. Uh, RIMS is uh, Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools. This, this presentation is going to be acronym filled. If you can pass the acronym test at the end, you can consider yourself certified in school safety. Uh, there's a lot of them in there. I, I have trouble with them sometimes. I've been going back and forth to Wade the last few days. What does this mean? What does that mean? But uh, part of that grant was that we hire a consultant to help with the implementation of the plan. It was a half million dollar grant. And we hired Mike McComas, who is a retired FBI agent. And he helped Wade in the training and the purchase of equipment as we implemented our plan through the RIMS grant. And we bring on Mr. McComas on occasion. He'll come back and work as a consultant and, and, and offer his advice also. Mr. Sheely or Wade's position is a dedicated position within the district, reports directly to me. I'm going to go through a few of the, um, I think I hit the thing too quick, I apologize. But we're going to go through uh, some of his responsibilities. There was one more slide here before I got to Wade's responsibility, I apologize. Me, Wade, we all, uh, Dr. Royster and several departments within the district we try to stay as current as we possibly can and abreast of all the new issues regarding school safety. These are some of the things that we've attended. Uh, down at the bottom you'll see SLED alert. Alerts not misspelled. That's advanced law enforcement, emergency rapid response training. Uh, we've sent SROs. It's a train the trainer program. We've sent them out to be trained. They've come back and worked with other SROs. Uh, Wayne Freeman is with SLED has come in and spoke to our principals. Uh, the city of Greer right now are, is working on a tabletop exercise um, with Wayne from SLED. They're going to bring in first responders. Uh, and I've asked them that it, 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 at a minimum, depending on how much space I have, that they, within the, since they serve Greer, that they bring in all the schools or at least some personnel from the schools within the city of Greer and any, anybody else to go through this training again. Wade's position, Coordinator of School Safety and Emergency Parent Preparedness. These are the major functions. Uh, he communicates with the, the other local responders, hazmat, law enforcement, emergency management, and make sure that our plan is aligned with their plan. He provides continuous support for training. The district, another acronym, we have what we call the DIRT team, District of Mont district emergency response team. Wade coordinates all the training for that, assists in the coordination of safety and security efforts with other departments, nursing, ETS operation and facilities. As I said earlier, it's a, a coordinated effort. The next two bullets are a lead in to the district emergency response plan. Um, Wade would, would refer to it as the blueprint when Mr. McComas was working with us. He called it our playbook. But Wade's major responsibility is, was to develop and update, continue to update our emergency response plan so that it reflects the current best practice in school safety. Our plan is a approximately 230 page document. It's NIMS compliant, National Emergency Management System, uh, addresses the four phases of emergency preparedness and response, mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and also contains pandemic, flu, biological outbreak, off-campus evacuation, and reunification, uh, and computer incident response protocols. The incident command system, ICS, is a, a component of NIMS. Every school has a emergency response team, and they all have responsibilities 
within the emergency command system. It, it has a leader, triage, different ways that you would respond to any emergency. Uh, that structure is also followed in our district plan, the DIRT team, um, and that team would respond to a school in the case of any kind of emergency and, and support the school level emergency response team. We share that plan with response agencies. They go back, review it, and make sure that we are all aligned in the same, um, the same way. The plan contains threat and risk assessment, emergency response protocols. Uh, students that are at risk for self-harm and abnormal behavior are also assessed and charted, and we put some of the slides in that these are in the plan. That's kind of hard to see, but it is a flow chart of if there is a threat, the progress or the, the progression that would be followed. I'll leave that there for a second. I think you can probably see it on your laptops. We've got it here. Okay. <coughs> There's also a flow chart if a child presents a, uh, a threat to himself. Those are the protocols that's followed in the final chart is kind of a combination of the two. As you look at that final chart, if you'd scroll back to that, uh, Kent, that is a most a more recent addition. We have had for a long time threat assessment response and, and self-harm response. This is an attempt to address behavior that might not fall in either of those two categories but one might look at and say there is some there is some issue there people are exhibiting uh, a behavior that is is creating concern uh, from others uh, counselors teachers school could be the school secretary the custodial staff and you'll see to the left some of the unusual behaviors that might present themselves uh, which <coughs> might have nothing to do with uttering a threat against someone else or a threat to harm yourself, but certainly are behaviors that would be concerning. And this is a chart to attempt to make sure that if those behaviors are identified or observed in someone, there is a process by which to refer that person to receive some assistance with addressing those issues. And then obviously at any point, and you can see that in that flow chart, if it becomes a threat to themselves or a threat to someone else, then it goes back to one of the two previous charts and is handled as a threat to someone else or a threat to themselves. Go ahead, Ken. In law enforcement, um, we work with seven different jurisdictions within the county of Greenville. Uh, Lieutenant Reinhardt with the county is also here today, and uh, we work very closely with him. But all our law enforcement agencies provide with contract an SRO at every middle school, an SRO at every high school, and we have several high schools based on enrollment that have more than one school resource officer. We also have zone patrols. Those are contracted off-duty police officers that roam. They go to all the elementary schools, child development centers, career centers that don't have a full-time SRO. Uh, right now, they make a minimum of three visits a day. They eat lunch at, the, at one of the schools as they go through their process. All seven law enforcement agencies also con conduct threat assessment tests. They try to breach the security of the school. They go through that each year. They let their SRO know they're coming, but they, they'll bring in a younger officer that looks school age, try to get through doors and, tr and test the security protocols that are in place at the school. They write that up and review it with the principals, and then they also give us a report at the district level once that's done. Um, I think it, currently for the year we've completed out of the South, I think we're through with six of those assessments, and the other is scheduled for next week. Door access cards have been provided to every jurisdiction within the district. If there is an emergency, uh, they have our key cards and they can quickly enter the building. They also, law enforcement officers also help us. When we review the safety plan that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, the district emergency response plan, we also involve law enforcement in the review of that each year. Uh, 
those agencies conduct active shooter response training in some of our schools during the summer uh, at the request of school administrators. Um, I don't know enough detail. I think we'll be getting ready to plan one now, but I need a little more detail on that. Uh, physical and security hardening of buildings. These are some of the things we've done over the last few years. Building design, the district builds new schools and, and renovate new ones. Security is a priority as we go through that process. Capture areas have been installed in all the new schools and retrofitted into the older ones. School lobbies are also fitted with a remote door lock switch to secure the main building from the lobby until a person is cleared for access. Rapid uh, RFD card readers have been installed on all the outside doors that are heavily used. Um, we had noticed like near playgrounds, some, some students weren't able to make a quick reverse evacuation back into the building. That's been addressed so that they can make a quick return back in. And there is a two-year process. I think it's actually been sped up to, to uh, exceed that. Of all the district's cameras, including the number of cameras, the qualities, and the areas of coverage within all the schools within the district. Raptor, I mentioned Randy Evett earlier. Randy manages that Raptor system. Um, records all visitors, vendors, checks against the sex offender registry, provides criminal background checks on volunteer on uh, level two volunteers, has the ability to flag anyone checking into school that is known threat or is a, on trespass notice. We have a system in place that if a person has shown themselves to be someone that really probably may pose a threat on campus or committed some accident, we don't want them there. That process, we issue them a trespass letter and then that person's name can be recorded in Raptor and it puts them on trespass notice and provides an alert at every school at the district. So if it happened at school A, all the other schools, if that person tries to enter, would also be notified that the person is on trespass notice. Flip charts, as we call them, quick reference guides, is a summary of the major issues within our um, district emergency response plan. Every teacher, every team, nurse, media center, fan supervisor um, have these cards. If there is an emergency within the school, they can quickly flip if they're not up to date on the protocols that they should follow. And it's a quick reference guide as to how they should proceed given whatever emergency that might be in front of them. Training equipment. Um, we show an active shooter training to all employees and all high school students. Uh, we also created a, um, a video a few years ago about how to interact with law enforcement when approached to try to help our students to know that the law enforcement agencies are there to help them. Um, in elementary and middle school, we leave that to the principal and the teachers. We've not shown them the video, uh, but they go over threat, threat procedures, lockdown, and how to respond if there is an issue within their school. Bus drivers are presented each year in active shooter response survival training before the start of each school year. Uh, there are hypothetical scenarios that they, that they go through. Every school is required to conduct a minimum of two partial and two full lockdown drills each school year. I uh, mentioned that our emergency response plan was NIMS certified. At least two administrators from every school have taken and completed two uh, FEMA courses and uh, are current in those processes. Each school nurse and SRO has a trauma bleeding control kit um, and as a precondition each one of those has taken and completed the uh, bleeding control course or its equivalent. There's ten, a minimum of ten first responders in each district. They're also trained in the trauma kits. We have AEDs in every um, school, those 10 first responders are also trained to use the AEDs. Within maintenance, Mr. McEwen maintains a district mobile response vehicle. Uh, if we had an emergency, district maintain the, the response vehicle. It contains uh, spare radios, radio chargers, base stations, uh, access to Wi-Fi, Raptor, and a local accountability program. Also, there is a uh, 
FM transmitter, transmitter that we can use to put out information to parents as they approach the school or approach the scene where we may be having an emergency situation to update them as best we possibly can. Redundant emergency communication systems. Every time there is an incident of within the district, many of us receive a hotline. I'll be interested to see how many I got while I'm standing here. But anytime, but it is a, the school immediately lets us know that there might be a possible situation and it gives me, Wade, my intervention specialist, Mr. Davey, Dr. Gary, Dr. Royster, uh, other administrators, we try to make as quick a response and assessment to what we see and get the associated people. Law enforcement also get those hotline reports. 911, uh, one touch 911 calling in all schools, two way radios, and we have and operate a UL certified 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day a year dispatch center. Safe Plans is a company we contracted with a couple of years ago. They replaced CPO Tracker. The Safe Plans software is called ERIP, Emergency Response Information Portal. That allows the schools to maintain and upkeep their security plan, the people that are assigned to that plan within that system. Uh, there are training videos within the system. Um, those include bomb threat assessment, security assessment, risk assessment, uh, all the way through tornado warnings, earthquake drills. And it also <coughs> pardon me, contains a tactical mapping component. Uh, the law enforcement agencies have been trained in it. They have looked at it. They love it. But it gives them an interior and an exterior view of the school and the schematics in case they were to have to respond to an emergency at any school in the district. Uh, that last bullet is basically what I just said with regard to the tactical mapping component. Programs and support uh, through Mr. Rhodes' office, Rob Rhodes, a lot of, and I think I went through the, uh, many of these a couple years ago with you, bullying programs, mental health counselors provided by agreement with Greenville Mental Health and Piedmont Mental Health. Uh, we have 74 in schools right now. We have a bullying tip hotline. We have a um, um, confidential phone line to anybody that has any kind of information that uh, they want to get through and have investigated. Policy JCDAG is in place consistent with the Safe Schools Act. Um, on Thursday of this week, Wade and Mr. Rhodes and I are going to uh, uh, a thing at the hospital, Upstate uh, Health Coalition. Um, there's 11 counties involved. It's early. It appears that it'll be mostly first responders with a focus on mental health issues or warning signs before an event occurs and support if, event, if an event does occur. So we'll be knowing a little bit more about that after we go on Thursday morning. Um, our plan, our emergency response plan, um, provides for aftercare response teams. They're in place and can respond to any crisis. Um, those teams, you know, when we have a, a situation in a school with a student death, they also respond to, to things like that to assist the students in grief. ETS, I mentioned earlier, monitors ensure that we're in compliance with state and federal laws. Cyberbullying and internet safety programs are conducted by the uh, the technicians in these ETS. They're part of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force and are on FBI Infrastructure Protection Partner. And some ETS personnel are active members of the State Guard and Cyber Security Detachment. I think Dr. Royster at this point is going to go through some enhancements that he's looking at as we go forward from this point. This sort of this is divided into two, really into two sections. Uh, next steps for consideration, things that we're looking at. Some of those involve recommendations we would make to you all. Others would be actions the administration would take uh, independently or or, or just our own initiative. And then also some things that we have already done 
at least a couple of them on a permanent, some on a temporary basis. Uh, we believe that an important next step for consideration is the permanent expansion of the zone patrol coverage, increasing the number of officers and decreasing the area of patrol zones. And obviously the, the benefit to that is a greater visibility and presence by commissioned law enforcement officers in our, there are actually 65 locations. Uh, now when I say locations, that would be everything from Sullivan Center to West Greenville to uh, Fine Arts Center, the uh, elementary schools that are now covered by the zone patrol. So it would decrease, uh, decrease the number of locations per officer and obviously at the same time increase the visibility and presence of those officers. Uh, we also believe that an important item to consider uh, is the additional mental health counselors. We have 74 mental health counselors now. There are 20 schools that do not have a mental health counselor in their school. The determination for where mental health counselors are located is at this point based on acuity, uh, the frequency of occurrence of the need for mental health counseling as determined by the Department of Mental Health. Uh, they actually employ the mental health counselors. They're based in our schools and they are generally funded through the Department of Mental Health by reimbursement from Medicaid, private insurance, or on an ability to pay schedule. What we would be looking at is perhaps some additional number of those counselors that might be employed to serve multiple schools of those 20 that do not currently have one on campus daily. Um, we're also looking at what additional programs might be available for students exhibiting concerning behaviors. The first step in that, if you think back to the flow chart that we presented to you that's uh, reasonably new for us is, all right, here are, the, here are the types of concerning behaviors that we want people to take note of. There are already some uh, places of referral for those students to be sent, but what other programs might we develop to uh, address those behaviors, or what other programs might we have access to that are uh, maybe uh, produced or sponsored by another provider? Trying to look at, again, at that public-private-public public, uh, partnership. When I say public-private-public, public, obviously we're public, but there are a whole lot of other public entities that provide those types of services. We're also reviewing the effectiveness of various door barricade devices. Uh, there, there are numerous ones out there. Uh, actually, the, uh, as, as many of the agencies do um, in the close working relationship that we have with them, uh, Simpsonville Police and the Simpsonville Fire Department are actually physically testing some of those devices for us at this time. Those are devices you can add to or slide under the door to make a classroom door uh, much less susceptible to force. Now it's important to note that at least to date, uh, we don't, again we don't have the feedback from what happened in an objective reporting format in Florida, but up until and until that particular active shooting incident, uh, the process that we follow of students uh, uh, sheltering in place, of students doing a lockdown, the process we follow there, there has not been any uh, victim of any of those school shootings who was sheltered in that way. But this would be an added uh, barrier to the door. We're also uh, looking at uh, discussions at the state level of some sort of credentialed and commissioned law enforcement officer that is a step up between an armed security guard, which you, you can, you know, some districts use those now, and an SRO. And we have a number of school resource officers. What we're looking at there is a step in between those, someone who's highly trained in security and responding to an active shooter incident or any other sort of violent threat it doesn't necessarily have to have all the other training and uh, abilities related to other law enforcement functions because uh, they, they wouldn't be out necessarily stopping cars on the highway or investigating crimes. They would be a, uh, a well-trained, highly trained, uh, security-focused individual as opposed to a law enforcement individual which might provide us some additional options, not for the point of replacing school resource officers because they have a very important place in protection of students in schools, particularly at the middle and high school level, 
but perhaps at other levels uh, where there would be less interaction with students on a daily basis. Uh, there's a lot of interaction at the middle and the high school level. Uh, those officers coaching, counseling, talking with students, making presentations in classes. Those sorts of things would be less necessary perhaps at an elementary or other level. Now the things that we have uh, already put into place is a temporary enhancement of the zone patrol to increase the frequency decreasing those patrol areas, adding to the number. We've increased the number and are doing more detailed drills of response to active threats. In other words, in different scenarios. We're also, uh, we did this several years ago, but it has been about three years since we've done it. Some additional training and refresher training for front office personnel in addressing irate and or irrational uh, individuals. Those are things that we have already uh, put in place or planning. Also, and Kent alluded to this in his presentation, participation of all members of our school emergency response teams in law enforcement live active shooter training as observers and or participants. Now this is not just doing the drills that we do in the school. This is actually going out. We've done this in at least three schools and we've done it in some uh, in some other settings where our personnel go out, observe, and may actually be a participant. They may be a, a hostage in the active live drills that law enforcement performs. So we're trying to work out a schedule now where those individuals, particularly that would be those first to respond in a school, have the opportunity to visit that, to be a part of that, and to see it firsthand, which is a much more uh, realistic training than, than simply the drilling of the protocol. Uh, we're also doing additional training of personnel and threat assessment and identifying and reporting unusual in our disturbing behavior. And we're moving to procure additional trauma kits to provide one for every one of the school level emergency response team members. We currently have a number of trauma kits in a school but not necessarily a smaller version for each uh, emergency response team member. And you know in, in schools we have at least 10 individuals, just like in this building, there are 10 first responders, uh, primarily individuals to render and, and give first aid. Uh, the other thing that uh, is, is somehow was omitted in this, and I, I, skipped, I skipped it actually, in uh, looking at the addition of countertop barriers in school, if you scroll back to there, Thank you, Kent. The addition of countertop barriers in school front offices to further enhance capture area security. In other, other words, further hardening that cap, the initial capture area. Uh, and we will likely be coming to you next month with a request to use some fund balance funding uh, to proceed immediately uh, with that project. We also are looking that we've got two, two project, one project under construction, one in design right now what might what future facility design changes might we make and what other retrofits might we make of existing facilities um, again to further secure them to further harden them as a target without creating a, a prison like atmosphere uh, and, and so that, that's obviously a challenge but it's a challenge that uh, that we are approaching and uh, and addressing as we as we go through design and new facilities and as we look at our current facilities. You'll also note in the next item under administration there's some requested and recommended uses of fund balance to the board for the remainder of this year, one of which is to uh, maintain this increased zone patrol uh, for the remainder of the school year and the second has to do with speeding the replacement of camera systems and when we demo that for you I think you will you will certainly see the uh, the great advantage in speeding the replacement of those camera systems from a two-year down to uh, inside one year hopefully uh, replacement uh, those are the items that we wanted to make sure that we covered for you I'm sure that you have questions maybe something that we did not cover or some clarification you need about the things that we did cover so uh, turn it back to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Royster. Um, and Mr. Owens, do we have any questions for either of these gentlemen or the specialists we have in the audience over there 
about school security in the public portion of the presentation. Ms. Morrison Fair. I just would like to clarify something. Your mental health counselors are separate from the counselors that we have for the district and they are funded by the Department of Mental Health? Yes, ma'am. We, we have counselors in a ratio of 1 to 300 at every middle and high school. At the elementary level, they're done a little differently. They're done based on providing a certain number of hours of service to the, depending on the size of school. Mm -hmm. The mental health counselors are separate and apart from that, though they work closely together. I'm sure that the counselors oftentimes see the same students. Uh, they refer, uh, our counselors would refer students to the mental health counselors. They are housed in our buildings, but their check is from the Department of Mental Health, and they are largely funded through Medicaid reimbursement, private insurance reimbursement, and they also have a sliding fee scale. So if you didn't have, you weren't eligible for Medicaid, you didn't have private insurance based on your income, you would be billed for the service. If mental health is not adequately funded at the state, would that affect us? Would we be able to pick up that cost? Right now, I, I think we have one of the most uh, aggressive schedules of having mental health counselors of any district in the state. But obviously any change in funding at the state level, either negative or positive, to the Department of Mental Health could affect those counselors. But again, they're, they're, they're funded on these reimbursements that they receive. So, you know, sometimes if you hear concerns about level of Medicaid funding, that certainly could affect the ability to have those counselors. We started with uh, a handful of those counselors. For a number of years, we had about 35 to 40 of them. And in recent years, we're, we're now up to 70, 74. And some locations have, have more, than, more than one. Thank you. I appreciate the district taking that effort to do that. We obviously believe that that's a key component um, to ensuring the safety of students. You know, it's the still the most thorough and current study that's ever been done about, act, about active threats, about active shooters in schools, was a study done by the U.S. Secret Service 2001-2002 following Columbine, and in a subsequent report uh, in a couple of years after that. And one part of that report, which is, is perhaps not very reassuring, and, and then I'll tell you about the parts that are, one part of that is there is no checklist for predetermining who an active shooter is. That, does not, that doesn't exist. Uh, and there, there, is no, there is not sufficient commonality between all of those active shooters for such a checklist type pro profile to be done. But what you do find in that report is a number uh, and a very high percentage of school or active shooters, and they, they could have been in other locations besides schools, displayed certain characteristics. And many of those would be addressed by mental health services. So it, it, it's important to know that those are some of the shared behaviors, uh, whether it relates to bullying, depression, feelings of isolation, things like that, that might be, might occur in fairly high percentages among those who have committed these atrocious acts that those are things that are best addressed by counseling and mental health services. So we believe that is as, that is as important a component to prevention as is hardening the entrance, having an armed response, to try to be on the front end. It fits within our plan. You know, as, as, as Kent went through that, our plan basically, now they, they talk about there being four components, we basically try to prevent something, respond to it when it happens, and then take care of people after the fact. Well, that mental health goes on the front end of that, of trying to prevent things from happening. So we believe it's an important component. Okay, other questions? Mr. Meek. What I can 
mask uh, uh, out in public. I think that I know that every one of us is concerned, uh, as we always are. I, you know, I think the one thing that we do know is that we don't know very much about it. You know, it's it's a problem that when it occurs, then we try to analyze it and see where see what they have done to try to find a pattern, which there apparently is no pattern. I'm not positive that more mental health counselors in schools is the right answer. I'm not sure that more law enforcement SROs in schools is the answer. I think that we're all struggle to see that. I think that we as a district need to provide as much assurance to to our constituents and the family to that we are doing something that that the district is not just sitting on their hind end waiting for a, a instance to something else to happen and i think we are doing that i think that uh, there's a lot of things that this district other districts throughout the state and the, and the nation could do if we had the money it always comes back to the to the to the uh, to the dollar, I think that we, as a board, can address this if we wanted to. We could increase our uh, our our taxes and everybody else's taxes to get that money. That's not a easy thing to do. But are we at that point where we should ask the public? Do you want us to do everything possible with a with the money we have, or or are you willing to provide more money for safety and security in our district? Or you know we can only you know we have no control of what our state legislators may or may not do with SROs, whether they're going to fund them or whether they're not. I'm of the opinion, you know, I've done a little bit of research, not nearly as much as Mr. Owens and others have done that deal with this on a daily basis. There's no one answer out there. I do think that we need to secure our buildings to prevent anyone from coming in that's not authorized as much as possible. And I'm sure all of us have that feeling. But do we take the money out of the classroom to do that? Do we take the money from from an educational point? Do we take the money from from more counselors? Where do we get the money? And I think that is, you know, until we address that part, I'm not quite sure that we can address over the, the rest of it. I think that we can keep taking money out of the reserve fund for for immediate uh, repairs, band-aids, or whatever you want to call it, to what we already have. But I'm not sure that we can really stop a person, whether they have a mental problem or not, from uh, gaining access to our school. I think that we have all read what the response times uh, is for law enforcement to get to the schools. We have all read and seen how long the average active shooter is active. So I think that we must try to prevent that shooter from ever getting onto our property, ever getting to a child, whatever it takes. You know, we have all seen the the steel doors that the, the you know costing us four thousand dollars each. And they're they're providing, but that is if we had the doors. And if there's, you know, we've got in our schools thousands and thousands of windows that, that is there. You know, if an active shooter can, if they so wanted, can stand out in the street and harm our kids before, before we know what's going on. So I think that is what we need to look at. And we need to, before we do that, we need to identify where we're going to get the money to do this and then uh, go from there. And, you know, I've got all kind of articles and whatever that, that I could 
talk about all day, but you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that would do anything uh, more than than uh, what the superintendents and the administrations already done. And so I think as a board, we've got to look at do we want to go out to the public and say, hey, do you want to uh, provide five million, ten million, or whatever the dollar may be on, a, on an annual basis to so that we can secure the buildings that make it as so that we can tell you that we have done everything possible. There's nothing else that we can do and and uh, to prevent this. So I think it, we as a board have got to look at this at some point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meek. Mr. Sada. Dr. Royster. Explain to me the difference between the mental health counselor and the school counselor. Uh, school counselor has a broad range of responsibilities, uh, perhaps not greatly different from counselors when, when you were active uh, working in a school, although the role has evolved over the years. But they're they're working with students on career counseling. They're working with them on college counseling. They're working with them on uh, uh, course selection. They're working with them on all, all sorts of issues or problems they might have. Mental health counselors are more focused on those students who have some sort of disturbing behaviors, have some sort of mental health Issues. They are more narrowly focused on dealing with students who are experiencing those kinds of problems. They don't do all those other things that school counselors do. Is there, is there a different uh, training for a mental health counselor than is a school counselor? Yes, sir. Do colleges have both what they would call mental health counselor uh, course and a school counselor? Yes, sir. In general, uh, school counselors are required to have a master's degree in, in, in school counseling. Uh, I can't speak specifically to the requirements for a mental health counselor, but they have some similar requirements, but I, I, there, I don't believe there's any requirement that they possess a master's degree. So the school counselor is mostly traditional? Yes, sir. And so we've, when did we add mental health counselors? Probably is, is is Mr. Rhodes in here, but I, I would say about five or six years ago. And the reason we did that was there an incident that necess necessitated that? I think seeing the overall need for those kinds of services to our students, and there has been an it's not an over exaggeration to say there has been an explosive growth in the identification of young people that suffer from depression, that suffer from other mental health issues. So our adding those mental health counselors has paralleled what we see in our students and what is not just a local, but a nationwide phenomenon. The, the number of students who, who report depression, the number of students who discuss harming themselves, the number of students who actually attempt to harm themselves in recent years has had double digit percent increases. So we're simply seeing that in the school setting, that which is occurring out in the community. The mental health counselor, that person is trained differently, I would assume, yes, than sir. with a regular counselor. Is there a different, I'm trying to think of the classification of each one of them yes sir but I, I I don't I'm not familiar enough to all the requirements to become a mental health counselor to actually specifically answer that but we will gladly get the answer for you so we we have 74 of them yes sir we have 74 so I'll assume that one is in every high school one is in every middle school or what no sir there are 20 schools that do not have one I will gladly send you the are list some of those high schools or middle schools they might be, but I think they're predominantly elementary schools. Again, it's based on the caseload for the mental health counselor because the way they're funded, 
uh, through mental health is they have to be generating a certain amount of, uh, of service to students to obtain the reimbursement to pay their salary. So am I correct in saying, Dr. Royster, that most of these 74 mental health counselors are in our elementary schools? Mm, maybe in number. Let, let me send you the list. I just don't have it in front of me. Yeah, I'm just trying to determine where we're trying to approach the mental health part of well, school safety when we're trying to prevent. Right now, where there is the largest number of students that are in need of that service. So it might be in the elementary, it might be at a middle school, or it might be at a high school. And one of the things we believe we need to do is provide some amount of coverage to the 20 locations that do not have one. Why do 20 locations not have? Because they don't have enough at this point. The Department of Mental Health has not identified a great enough need to warrant them placing one there because they only place them when their services can be paid for through billing, Medicaid, private insurance, or private pay. So these mental health counselors are not paid by the school district? No, sir. And if we look at those 74 that yes, we sir. have that are all paid for by mental health? Yes, sir. Do we have a description of a mental health counselor? Uh, I don't have one in front of me, but we will get you that. I'd be interested to, to learn more about mental health counselors. Yes, sir. And I, and I assume that what we're trying to approach this problem from is from the elementary. Or am I wrong on that? Or are we trying to take care of it from K through 12? We, we want to approach it wherever it first manifests itself. And that might be high school, that might be middle school, and it might be elementary. All right. so, so this is much more than school safety. It also involves, you know, if I'm bullying or if I don't feel like I'm a part of the school community. If you go back to that Secret Service report that I referenced earlier, a high percentage of those individuals who committed active shooter uh, incidents in schools and other locations reported that they were the victim of bullying. I think 30-something percent. Why did that sound about right? Maybe 36 percent, something like that. Can I get a copy of a quick reference guide? Flip the chart. flip chart, yes sir. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd be interested to look at that and see exactly how we uh, distinguish between different kinds of behaviors and what those behaviors lead to and what our response is to those behaviors. Oh, you're talking about the flow charts that we put on the screen, not well, the, I've seen the flow emergency chart. plan. He says that we, do we have a quick reference guide that we give to each teacher or is it each principal or what? Who gets a quick reference guide? Many different employees, but those address more the situation, not necessarily the behavior. How to respond if there's a bomb threat. How to respond if we have to evacuate for um, uh, an active shooter, tornado drills. The response is not necessarily the behavior is outlined in those flip charts. When we have an incident at school, I would be interested in knowing what the policy is about entrance into the school. Who would be the first to come to the school? Do they have to wait on somebody before they can come in the school? Or the first one that's there is the first one that goes in school? Are you talking about law enforcement response? I'm talking about whether it be EMS or whether it be a training plan, whether it be a fire department, whether it be a police department, or whether it be this resource officer, whoever it may be. Do we have a policy on that that says it? I remember it used to be, you know, you got to wait, we got to set up a response team. No, sir. And then you enter the building. No, sir. Without exception, every one of the seven agencies that serves Greenville County Schools, the municipalities and the sheriff's office, their policy, their protocol, and their training is the first officer engages the suspect, period. If that's the SRO, if it's one of our zone patrol officers that happen to be in the vicinity, if it's a regular patrol officer, if it's a detective riding down the street, happens to be close in response, it is their policy, protocol, and procedure that that person engages the shooter. Well, all those people are armed. Yes, sir. What about if someone's not armed? It could be an M -E EMS. I can't. I can't or it be a fireman. Uh, I would assume that the EMS and the fire department take their lead from law enforcement. One of, the, one of the aspects of this, if you'll recall back in the early part of the slides that Kent presented, where it talks about that national incident management structure, 
if something happens anywhere, it doesn't matter if it happened in this building, at the movie theater, at the mall, or at the school, that incident command structure dictates who's in charge. If it's a crime scene, law enforcement's in charge. If it's a fire scene, the fire chief's in charge. If it's a, some sort of casualty event that's not fire or law enforcement, EMS is in charge. And whoever else responds takes their lead from the person in charge. In a fire, they take their lead from the fire chief. In a criminal matter, they take their lead from the senior law enforcement officer present who is the incident commander for law enforcement. I've, I've been looking at Spartanburg. In Spartanburg, he's talking about arming some of the fire department personnel because, and also that they have a policy in Spartanburg that the first one there that you have to go in. Mm -hmm. And if I am an EMS and I'm the first one there and I go in, then there's not really much I can do if there's a, a situation that involves a, a, a shooting. We understand the fire. We understand the tornado. Yes, I remember when we had the, the atomic bomb drills in that regard. But now we yes, got sir. to add another one. And this is for a crazy drill. The, uh, and, and, and while, while Mike's making his way up here, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, only, the only armed EMS personnel that I'm aware of is there are EMS medics that are part of the sheriff's, you all don't call it a SWAT team, but. Yes, there are actually SWAT medics on our, on our SWAT team. They were actually employed by EMS before, now they're employed by the sheriff's office. They maintain their paramedic certifications, but they are actually members of the SWAT team, and they are hired by the sheriff's office. But they're credentialed, and they're sworn law enforcement officers, and they're armed. As of Sheriff Lewis's uh, election, that's correct. Now, that is not true of regular responding EMS personnel, and the active shooter response from law enforcement is they're going to the threat. And, you know, it, it's, I, I, I guess the only way to say this is to plainly say it. They're, they're going to go around whoever's in it. They're going to go to the threat. That's Their correct. job is to remove the threat. Columbine changed the way law enforcement responds to active shooter. And ever since Columbine, um, there's no more staging and waiting for the SWAT team. The first law enforcement officer that gets there goes in, whether he's by himself or whether he's with another group of law enforcement. As far as EMS and fire department go, um, I can only speak for in Greenville County, but a lot of times, even on our normal calls for service, the EMS response to, they will stage and will not go until law enforcement responds to the scene and clear it. Active shooter is no different. We also have some regular EMT will train with us during active shooter incidents um, and has been broken down to <coughs> hot zones, warm zones, and cold zones. So basically, if we respond and take care of the shooter, we will actually conduct secondary searches, and while we're conducting that secondary searches, there are some EMS that will respond with our tactical teams wearing tactical gear so we can start rendering first aid sooner than we normally would in the past. We understand about the traditional emergencies in schools, but this new emergency, I think it would help if our principal knew what our policy is about if there is an active shooter in the school, how do we respond to that? The principal needs to know whoever comes there first is the one who goes in. Or does it have to be someone who is with a police trained? If we've got a person that's not police trained, which I would assume would be an EMS or a fire department, then they would not be P police personnel they would be emergency personnel so uh, I'm trying to determine understand is there a difference between when we got someone coming to the school to assist or aid do, do we know inside that if I have this person come is he going to come in or is he going to stay out they, they know by the training that we require every employee to participate in that the first response is going to be to remove the threat intending to anyone who might be injured would be secondary to that response. So yes, sir, they already know that. We need to make sure that our principals know that. They do. Because the four that I talked to didn't know. Well, then they're not paying close attention to the video they're required to watch. And if you let me know who those four are, I'll make sure they know. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
when can I see the video? You can see it any time. We'll be glad to share that with you. I think How you long? all. I think you all have seen it as a group, but we'll I send it back around. I, I don't. I don't recall the, the amount of emphasis that we placed on shootings in the school. Is that video all about? school shootings and how we prepare for that or yes, do we sir. cover other things as well no sir active shooter active shooter now there are other trainings that we have for people uh they have to take the nims training the two two nims trainings principals and assistant principals uh but the one we're specifically talking about right now has only to do with active shooter what about if it's a bomb there is a process and a procedure for that it's covered in that flip chart. It's covered in the bigger uh, the book. Flip the flip chart is in the quick reference. That, that so when they're talking about a quick reference guide, guide, that's the flip chart. All right. I'd like to have a copy, though. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Sadath. Ms. Leventis Wells. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm hoping we won't get feedback from my mic. It's, it's a little scratchy, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out who I'm going to direct this to. And Dr. Royster, you may want to chime in. But our Gringo County School District, our schools are in a unique situation because the response time is usually three minutes uh, to our locations if there's an incident that occurs. Is that correct? That's the average national response time, yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Average so, national. Is it national. National, what about Gringo County? I don't actually have those numbers in front of me, so I don't know what if we can provide you a little insight into that. I prefer to do that in executive session. Okay. So also, when we talk about all of the things that we're doing, it informs everybody as to our security and, and the things that we have implemented. Sometimes I feel like we say too much, and people know to have too much information about our schools. And I understand everybody's concern. But I've gone to several meetings and I've had people, parents say, you know, I've our kids have never felt unsafe at school. Uh, and I tell them, thank you. I appreciate that because you also tell others your same feelings and your, um, the way you see things. Now, does that mean our schools are safe? We're always going to be tested. Everyone's always going to be tested. I appreciate your implementation plans. And every time there's an uh, active shooter, shooter situation, we fine tune what we already have in place because things change over time. Uh, Wade, I'm sure when you first went to active shooting uh, training, that has since changed because of all of the techniques that have been incorporated and the way uh, mental health has played a, a, a situation in the policy and procedure as to the way we've handled it in the past. Because we're always, and Randy, I'm sure you can uh, attest to that as well. So we're always finding out what we do better. And I, I appreciate the district taking that step and we've got to make sure that all of our schools and personnel know how to react yeah you know i keep hearing about uh metal detectors metal detectors metal detectors uh i agree with some of my colleagues i think metal detectors give a false sense of security because there's so many doors to our, facil our schools that you cannot put a metal detector and have someone there 24-7 to assure that there's not going to be a weapon that comes in after school hours that could be used during the day. You can't do it. You've got track, you've got football, you've got tennis, you've got beta, you've got all these after school activities and when all the students leave People think, well, nothing, you know, the metal detectors, you don't have to supervise those. But that's not true. If you're going to have metal detectors, you've got to have them at every door. And you've got to make sure you've locked all the windows in the school because people can pass anything through a window. So I think the metal detectors is not as a safety mechanism as most people feel that they are. 
Is, am I off base, uh, Dr. Royster? You know, that, that lines up with some of, the, some of the things that we know about metal detectors. You mentioned many of those things. For it to be reasonably effective, you have to basically seal off the whole building. And everybody has to pass through a common entry point or some multiple common entry points. We've well, got to have the metal detectors. You've got to have some sort of x-ray device. Or you've got to have somebody who's going to search everything, pocketbooks, whatever, just like when you go to the airport. And the, and the airport's a good example. And, and I believe if I've got my, if I have kept the numbers straight, a very highly safe place to be. Mm -hmm. High level of security, uh, people getting on planes, uh, going through TSA. But I believe, uh, and Wade and Mike might have to correct my number, but I think in 85% of the test of TSA security, when they test that with undercover, like we do testing, can you get in the building, they find they're able to get something through. Yes, sir. So it's not 100% foolproof. Um, this most recent incident, a as some other incidents, you know, obviously this person was armed with a long gun. You don't need a metal detector to, to find that and was able to get close enough, in that case get in, and, uh, and do the harm that he did, but had they had metal detectors in use there, and I'm, I, don't, I don't think they did, but had they, it would be reasonable to assume that people would have been gathered up at one, two, or three primary entrances to that building to pass through the metal detection, which is a reasonably, even with people that, you know, the number of staff they have when you go to the airport, even staff to that level is not a fast process. So you've, you've you have pulled targets for a person who intends harm. So I think when you when you look at the fact that it doesn't it doesn't move it from the very low percentage of something happening to zero percent, and the fact that it could create a targets of convenience for someone who simply altered what they were going to do, I don't believe it it buys the level of security that one might just off the top of the head think, well, you know, that'd be a great thing to do. That would, that would solve the problem. Uh, it, it just doesn't move it, uh, to, again, to, to zero. And your point earlier, we, we try to walk a very fine line. We want people to feel, feel secure, as you indicate, that most, most students and, and parents do feel secure. Uh, we want them to feel secure, so we want, to, we want people to know enough about our procedures that they feel safe and secure. We want people out there that might intend to do something, maybe to look at that and be somewhat and be discouraged from trying anything. But we don't want to say so much that we one appear we're challenging somebody to breach it, or two that we reveal some of the finer points that enhance the ability for law enforcement and others to respond. So it's a very narrow line that we try to walk between giving enough information that people feel safe and secure to that point where we have said too much and revealed. Uh, any any time you reveal too much about something, people can search through that and try to find the weaknesses in it. And we, we don't want to provide that level of information to the general public. Yes, sir, and, and thank you, because I feel the same way, and, and I know that we are securing our schools to the best of our ability. And can we do more? Well, I agree with Mr. Meek, we, we can do more. It takes funding and so forth. Um, I will say that as I was coming back from Columbia the other day, and I'm pa I, I was probably a mile away from on the interstate from Hillcrest, and you could see that unit there that has police. It was very visible, and I thought pretty effective, you know that there is someone at that location. Um, and I, I, I appreciate that. But I think the visibility of SROs and, and law enforcement um, periodically driving by the premises and walking in and so forth, I think that's important because it shows our community that law enforcement is involved with the sheriff's office and all of the other municipalities, Greenville City and so forth. I think it's very important that our SROs uh, are highly qualified and trained to be able to respond 
an appropriate time ma manner and that they're not second guessing themselves but it's it's a it's just a normalty as to how they would handle the situation and yes maybe this summer we need to really focus on uh, staff at the high schools making sure that they don't allow and and I know parents are going to get frustrated because they're not going to be able to just buzz them in like they have been but I think we really need to tighten up that process when visitors and so forth are trying to get in the building because it frustrates me I'm you know I, I'm holding my badge and they're looking to make sure that you know I just don't have somebody else's badge and I I appreciate that but I'm sitting there going, come on, you know me. And really, that should not be the way I look at it. I should look at it as I appreciate you taking the time to securing the entrance of someone coming into your building. And I think we have to make the parents aware of that, that people just can't enter. Um, and, and so, uh, Ken, I, I'm going to task you and Dr. Royster that, you know, if there are maybe four people that Dr. Sut uh, that Mr. Suttis stated um, do not uh, fully understand the procedures for some of the um, things that we've implemented, then they're going to be triple that in other locations. So I'm going to task us with that, that everybody know, understand, and be trained in the way and the policies that we are implementing. And not that it's just hearsay. Say Debbie's the principal at one school, Michelle's the principal at another, and uh, Crystal works in the school at another. I don't want to assume that Debbie's going to tell all her staff and she's going to make sure they're trained. And I'm thinking Michelle's going to tell hers, but she, it might have slipped through, and she does it so her staff isn't going to know. And Crystal is at another school that didn't get the information. I want everybody to feel comfortable, everyone to understand, and everybody to know the way it works. I think uh, Mr. Royster, Dr. Royster, I'm calling Dr. Suddeth, Mr. So I'm getting these doctors and misters confused here. But Dr. Royster, um, I know you, you stated that um, we're trying to train them for muscle well, I think that might be a term that might might use uh, might Reinhardt use, but but the same will be true of us. We want them to go reflexively to do what they've been trained to do. Now, to your point, we track who's been trained. Right. So we have a list of everybody that's done what they're supposed to. So, uh, like I said, we'll we'll follow up with those four that seem that not crazy? not to know what to do, and make sure they know. Uh, you also will see in a little bit as a part of ERIP, they mentioned that in their presentation that now our training comes with test questions at the end so that that's a, a little bit of a change so I think that addresses the two issues that's good so the more you practice it it just becomes a natural reaction mm -hmm. and um, it's not something we want to force everyone to do but it's something that everyone needs to do and when you talk about and I'm so not for this arming teachers in the school teachers went to school to learn how to educate and and that's what their focus was it wasn't to uh, carry um, a weapon and and I, I would not want that I would want the professionals who go to the Academy and who are trained constantly and have to constantly uh, qualify on the firing range and take additional classes I would want those protecting our children because no one knows how they're going to react in a certain situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Levins, as well as Dr. Ball O'Connor. Yes. Um, any of the comments have been made. I'll just say that I appreciate, your, Dr. Royster, that you are hitting on all the different areas of a complex rep response system, including our facilities, our mental health, and our law enforcement protection and partnerships. Um, one thing you mentioned is adding additional um, speed in replacing video equipment. And I want to know the role, if you could describe it, in our facilities, because it seems um, very important that you could imagine manning all entryways through observing um, on video cameras much 
less expensively than other kinds of manning of entryways or changing out equipment. So what is that, um, how does that position us and are there partnerships with what you're trying to do with any um, specific kind of video security um, providers? Well, we, we already have the, uh, the equipment, we already have the uh, plans laid out, the, all the facilities have been assessed as for camera placement. This is part of the replacement. You know, the best program, we put cameras in the schools. Well, those cameras are now fairly old. So we had a planned cyclical replacement and upgrade, much more enhanced system as far as number of cameras and the ability of the camera system. What we'd like to do, and it's in, I think, in your next item of business, we'd like to accelerate that replacement, and instead of it taking two years, try to get it completed before school starts next year. Because part of the replacement was based on funding over time, and I think about two million we requested would allow that to be completed as fast as we can get contractors and our own personnel. Part of it is done by our own personnel. The final connections and linkages to our system are done by our own personnel. The initial installation is done by contract uh, contractors. But those cameras are a critical part of our ability to watch key they're, areas on our campus. They're a critical part of, of watching, and we do not have someone permanently assigned at every school to do that, but in many schools someone is looking at that camera that's pulled up on the screen. We have the ability to pull that up other locations. We'll, we'll, we will go into that uh, when we go into executive session, before you take, actually before you take up that item. Um, it, it is not just a deterrent, it greatly assists the response. Okay. If we have a if we have an incident, okay. Um, the mental health um, part, Mr. Suddeth did a good job of asking about the mental health providers, but I just want to say I appreciate you asking for a reduction in the school counselor to student ratio because we've you've made some moves in that direction over time, and we certainly reinforced that with our policy work this year in saying that we wanted our students to be known well by multiple adults in the building and to have that sense of belonging so that we reduce um, depression, suicide attempts, et cetera, and with our strong mental health programs and components that we're putting in place. So I believe that that's a, a very valuable investment for people to understand that as a prevention to safety issues, we are taking actions for mental health in our schools as well through counseling. Um, and they, those are the ones who are providing the training and reaching out in classrooms routinely to let students know what is available, what is healthy, how to respond, how to get help. So that is a very um, important part of the role our guidance counselors have as well. Um, so thank you for that recommendation. The final thing I would say is that in, in our facilities, um, I guess entryways, I would just like for you to speak to the fact that in Greenville County, we probably have taken the lead in safety in our facilities because a lot of schools do not have the kind of um, careful entryways that are costly that we have made an investment in and I would like our community to be reminded that we're unique in Greenville County to have protected each and every school through those additional entryways. Could you speak to that, please? Yeah, it's, uh, without going into a lot of detail, but we quite often and have received numerous requests in the last couple of weeks from other places. What are you all doing? Because uh, I think we are doing what would be considered best practices. Uh, in trying to harden our facilities, in trying to make sure that we have appropriate monitoring, appropriate response. Uh, you know, we didn't talk about it that much in, in here. You got some information on it, and I know you all know uh, Lieutenant Reinhardt. That in and of itself is unique in the state of South Carolina. There is no other school district in this state that has a law enforcement entity assigned to it. Now, they have school resource officers, but not individuals Excuse like me. Lieutenant Reinhardt and the people that work with him Excuse at school me, Dr. enforcement. Um, we have one more speaker after Dr. Bala O'Connor. Without objection, I'll extend for 10 minutes. I apologize. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. I, I didn't 
in here. Um, that is a very unique, and in fact, had an inquiry, I think, last week or week before last from a neighboring county as to how they might set something like that up in their county. Uh, but we do, we believe we have a very comprehensive plan in place. We believe it hits in each of the areas that you need to provide for in prevention, in response, in aftercare. It does everything that we believe that we've learned from these incidents in other places. It tries to apply as much of that as we're reasonably able to apply in our situation. And uh, I, I, there is no place in this country, even among those facilities and individuals who are guarded at the highest levels, where they can be 100% guaranteed of their safety. Any, any loss, any loss of a life in a school or anywhere else is a tragedy. It's something we want to absolutely avoid if we can. But we also know the facts are, in the most recent year's statistics from the U.S. Department of Justice, there are 1,053 school-aged children that are victims of homicide in the country. 1,053. Again, one's too many. 1,053. Of the 1,053, 1% of them are victims of a homicide in a school. So all the work we're doing, we're trying to get from 1% to zero, and we would like to be at zero. So all of our efforts are focused, how can we get as absolute close to zero as we can possibly get? And we try to focus on that and do those things that we've learned through studying what's happened to other places, through the experience in other places, what, what worked and what didn't work, and how we might move as close to zero as, as we can possibly move. Thank you, that's all. all right, thank you, Dr. Bala Connor. Ms. Goodwin Caldwell. Thank you, Ms. Grayson. Um, Dr. Royster, have we thought about the role that the interventionists and the support staff that um, deal with a lot of our students that have the issues, have we thought about their role in this security plan? Are they part? Yes, ma'am, they, they have a key role plan? in it. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested in knowing um, on the billing of with mental health, what the percentage is on, on uh, Medicaid and uh, privately billed because, I mean, with personal experience with being in a Title I funded school, I know that all of the Title I funded schools have mental health counselors because the, the uh, mental health is being reimbursed mm -hmm. by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So those 20 schools are probably the schools that don't have a high um, free and reduced lunch population. So I would be interested in knowing um, their percentage of billing. Um, We'll, we'll with, certainly with, with what schools, um, if, if that is um, something that can be done. We'll, we'll certainly ask them. We actually go through, some of you may know this or may not know it, there are two mental health providers in Greenville, Greenville Mental Health and Piedmont <coughs> Mental Health. We actually work with both of them. They have kind of a defined service area. Uh, so we'll ask them. I don't know that we have, we probably don't have that information in-house. But we certainly ask them and share that with you when we get their response. And I know that the mental health counselors have been around since about 2009 because I know we had them a long time ago in my school. So I just wanted to let Mr. Sutter know that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin Caldwell. Mr. Meade. Um, Madam Chairman, just wondering, after we get our update in executive session, are we going to have a chance to come back and ask questions or make a motion or whatever. I suggest we go ahead and conclude public questions at this time and then I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session where we can also entertain questions, but that will be the end of it. So if you have questions that can be asked publicly, now's the time. If you have questions that you believe would be better addressed during executive session, I'll entertain a motion once we conclude this portion. Okay, I have, I have a question. Um, Dr. Royster, how would I go about obtaining an assessment 
that we could make public on what our capability is of ensuring as much safety as possible with the funds that we currently have with steps up what we could do if we had like I said earlier this amount of money this amount of money this amount of money and that's where I do and I don't know if I'm the only one that's interested in that and I don't know whether I need to sort of make a motion and we could all weigh in on that or would you be able to bring that back to us at some time in the future without you know I hate to put you and your administration in a whole lot of um, I don't want to say disarray, but you know, a whole lot of extra work uh, coming up with the with the budget process and other things that you've got to do. So, but I think it's important that we address the funding part of it at some point down the road. I think that uh, to me, the 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 uh, the, the most productive way for us to do that because we already got some things that we're going to bring to you in the budget that, mm -hmm. that you've kind of seen a sort of a preview of them and I have a dollar figure on them and you see some requests we're going to make to you for fund balance right now but for us to put in the administration and in, in, in the people that we we coordinate with outside to other agencies uh, would take some amount of time to do that but put together some sort of tiered proposal of well we, rec we want to do these things right away. We have the funding to do that. If these are best practice steps, then here's what the, these additional things would cost. That, that sounds to me like what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. And I think simply if you were to, to say for the administration to bring that back to the board, to the, to the entire board at some point in the future when it's prepared, n not us wanting to drag it out forever, but realizing there are all these uh, other things occurring this is a priority I think we can do it in a reasonable amount of time uh, that might be for for the fall might be some some sort of time frame like that because we're going to come to you with more immediate steps right away so it wouldn't be we're deferring the ones that we think are most uh, most important and most timely but it might be those that might be longer term or if they or if they have more expense with them Okay, would you would you need a request from the board or a request from me be enough? We, we can sim simply do that, however you all want to approach it, but that, that would be the way that I would suggest that we respond to to the issue that you've raised. And I, and I think that just kind of follows along with the way that we're already handling the <coughs> first part of this. Okay. So, okay. so you, we, we'll gladly do that without a affirmation of the board but if the board feels more comfortable affirming that no problem with that madam chairman what do you feel i think it's done <laughs> okay i'll leave it alone thank you <laughs> okay dr paula connor did you have something additional no. in public okay um i have no further speakers at this time i will entertain a motion to go into executive session for the madam have chair. A motion the, no go ahead i have a motion do i have a second you have a motion to go into executive session for yes. a security briefing? Yes. Okay. I'll. And Ms. Fitzer will send you a list of the mental health counselors shortly. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We're in going into executive session. Do we need anything other than ourselves? No. Nope. Okay. The next item on our agenda is item 3.02, approval of fund balance expenditures. Dr. Royster. Thank you, Ms. Grayson. You have in front of you a request from the administration. As you recall, uh, for a number of years, we have had revenue in excess of expense from the previous fiscal year. Uh, we generally have that because we try to make certain that we do not expend greater than 90 really greater than 98 percent we certainly don't want to spend more than 99 percent of a fiscal year budget because when you run that close to the line you run the danger of going into the red and we absolutely don't want to go into the negative in a budget it has the uh, uh, 
uh, could have the effect long term of, of adversely affecting our credit rating. So it's not unusual that we would bring to you a request generally in the fall or winter of each year of some expenditures that are non-recurring that we would ask you to use revenue and excessive expense from the previous year. In other words, going into fund balance, not going below the amount the board requires us to keep in there, not going below the amount that we feel comfortable having in there, which is a little higher than the board minimum to maintain our appropriate cash flow. So you have in front of your request from the administration in four different areas. But all of those are really directly related, three of the four directly related to safety. And one is, with a little amendment that I need to say to you as we go through this, to replace the district on 95, 96, and 97 model activity buses. Those being the year model Thomas built rear engine buses that have been prone to thermal events. Now we have some other 95, 96, 97, doesn't, we're not talking about those. These are the same buses that the state has had the experience of having thermal events with. And although we have a bus replacement cycle, we believe it would be important to go ahead and get those buses out of the fleet and off the road for our purposes. That's $1.62 million. The second one has to do with some information that came forward during the, uh, the work that the board did and, uh, based on uh, or about school student transportation. And it's to purchase two 15 passenger and three 30 passenger school bus compliant minibuses outfitted as if they were school buses, yellow stop arms, appropriate warning lights that we can use to try to extend uh, to some of these very long, more uh, mostly rural routes, a smaller capacity bus to make the route time for those routes quicker. Now we did that as a pilot in five different areas. Transportation has already identified the areas that we would pilot. If the pilot is successful, we try to keep those in place and continue to use them. If the pilot's unsuccessful, we simply put them in our activity bus fleet and they'd be used for activity bus purposes. So either way, it would be an enhancement to, uh, to student transportation, either regular route transportation or student activity transportation. The third one, and you heard us reference that several times in the public presentation and again in the executive session presentation, that is accelerating the security camera replacement and enhancement cycle to implement the upgraded cameras and software, which you saw demonstrated, uh, inside the two-year funding rollout. We want to try to get that done, if at all possible, by early fall, but certainly as quickly as we can do so given limitations of contractors and our own personnel. But that would remove any financial barrier to getting it done as quickly as possible. And the fourth is as we have done since the incident in Florida, we'd like to continue through the end of the year with these enhanced zone patrols. That is, a greater number of officers assigned to smaller geographic areas increasing the number of times they're in the schools and locations they serve. Uh, we had a little bit, of, we all, we've always had a little bit of funding in that budget to enhance the patrols periodically through the year. We don't have the amount in there to continue that now continuously till the end of the year. And so we would request the 300,000 to use for that purpose. Uh, in the file for the general fund budget, we will likely be bringing to you a recommendation to make that it will be a larger amount than 300000 but to make that a, a permanent change in our general fund budget to enhance uh, both the frequency and decrease the geographic area that those zone patrol officers cover. Those are the four items. Again, the administration requests approval to move from general fund fund balance to fund those four items. Uh, we also discussed uh, <clears throat> with you and likely would bring forward perhaps next month or the following, but most likely next month, uh, some requested funding out of that same source to accelerate enhancing those capture areas. We're just not ready with a dollar figure today, but likely we'll have that for you for your April <coughs> Committee of the Whole. That, that would be a general fund budget request. Madam Chair, 
Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve assigning four million one hundred eighty-five thousand of the general <coughs> fund to fund balance to fund four items related to safe, efficient transportation and school security. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Goodwin, call off. Dr. Royster, um, in looking at the items, why is it that we are just wanting to purchase five buses, which are the daily route buses, and we're replacing activity buses, which are not used all the time? Why do we have um, more money for the activity buses than replacing? I mean, then purchasing the buses for daily routes. Because it seemed like it should be the other way around. Well, as you know, it's not our responsibility to provide the regular route buses. So the second item, the regular route buses, is for us to do a pilot. As you may recall, in the study about transportation, the, one of the recommendations was to run some smaller buses on these mm -hmm. most rural, rural routes with the small number of students. Now, you still got drive time, but it cuts out all the stop time by using, and we're going to use, we propose to use a mix of 15 and 30 passengers based on the routes that Mr. Davey and Mr. James have already identified to pilot that. If that's Is that enough for all of the routes that need to be covered? That's or enough for us to do a pilot to see if this is effective. Then, then we would either, then we would either expand that or we'd request the state to fund the expansion of it. This is really a test to see, is this something we can do, and will it make the difference that we believe it will make? If the test is unsuccessful, we'll simply turn those buses back into our activity fleet. Okay, what, what percentage of the fund balance is this 4185000 What percentage Mr. is Knox. this right now? Approximately 3%. 3%? Yes, ma'am. And, and you don't know what the percentage is that you're going to be asking for, which you said you didn't have the numbers for it today. Approximately $2.65 million. So that will be... No, we had not put a <laughs> fine point on it, but approximately. Yeah. So it could be 3. Uh -huh. could be 2.5, but somewhere between 2.5 and 3. Um, those are numbers, before we make any of these recommendations, we closely look at our fund balance. We have a lot of discussion with Mr. Knotts and his staff. These are amounts that are inside the amount that he feels comfortable that we can reduce fund balance without any adverse effect. And that number four, um, how many more patrols would that be? I, I, I see you say increase the number of patrols um, because with uh, the elementary schools not having SROs and they just have the zone patrols, um, they're not covered the whole day like the other schools are. So I, what, what, how, may, how many is this talking about? I would request the board go into executive session for me to answer okay. that question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll gladly answer it, but I want to do that in executive session. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Cobble. Anyone else? Mm -mm. All right. I have a motion and a second. I'll, uh, Mr. Meek. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> On the um, on the new buses that we are getting, they will have the Wi-Fi on them like uh, the others. The regular route buses, yes, sir. Yes. We put we would put Wi-Fi on them because it does some, as you know, it does some things beyond just provide connectivity for students. Okay, with with the Wi-Fi, does that allow the district to know where those buses are at? Yes, sir. With, with the Wi-Fi, does it allow parents to know where those buses are at? No, sir. There are, we know there are apps that will allow that. Mm -hmm. We've had some internal discussion about that. There are advantages to parents knowing where those buses are. There are disadvantages to other individuals mm -hmm. who could know where the buses are. But, but there, is, there is the availability of that technology. And there are some districts in the state that are using that. Okay. I, I, had, I had seen and heard that. I was just wondering if we were l even looking at that. We have, and we've had that discussion back and forth of 
the disadvantage of people being able to access where they are versus the advantage of being able to access where they are. Yeah, for some reason, I know more about busing than I used to, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, the uh, other question I had is the program that we use now, and now I was thinking about this coming to work this morning, this, or coming to the meeting this morning, was the program we have now identifies where students are allowed to be picked up or, or where the bus stops are, or do we have to do that manually yet? Can you ask that a different way, Mr. Mick? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. The routing of the buses on, on their routes for the individual uh, uh, driver, the driver just has to know where to stop. There's not a GPS or anything that allows them to do that. Now they can. I don't know how far we are on the rollout. Is Bill, is Bill back in here? Uh, and, and I know Adam's not here. We have the ability for them to use a tablet to do that now, but they can't use the tablet while the bus is in motion. Jeff, you might could speak more specifically to that. Piloting uh, within a, currently like having a tablet installed on 10 buses that we own, magnet routes. Uh, the tablets can be used for a number of reasons. One is uh, keeping track of a bus driver's time. We're also looking at allowing those tablets to have the bus route on the tablet for the very particular reason if we got a sub bus driver on for that bus, mm -hmm. they can pull up that route and see where they're supposed to go. Just like your GPS on your phone, and gives you the route. And it, it works off the GPS that's in that Wi-Fi system. I didn't know how far along we were with that, but I knew we were, we were running trials on it. But it as not only that, but as, a, as Jeff said, a time, time keeping mechanism. But, but it would, but the program would allow, like, just like my GPS in my vehicle, it'll say, make a left, make a right, next stop, or, you know. I don't know that it will do that. It will allow you to view it on that tablet, but it won't allow you to use that tablet while the bus is in motion. But it's an improvement over what we have now, which is we fax the turn-by-turn -turn directions to the nearest school and they stop and pick them up. Yeah. Or they have to give them the turn-by-turn -turn over the radio or the old standby, most reliable method. There's generally a student on every bus that knows the route. Probably. Well, I, no, I was, just, I was just thinking how, how convenient it would be if we had the program built into the bus and GPS that would you know, tell the driver the next step so that if there is a substitute, the, the only problem, of course, or not the only problem, but a problem would be if they didn't use the same bus. You know, the, you know, well, the technology, it was, it was the technology's mobile. there. I don't know that we figured out a way that we can be compliant with the safety rules and the driver use it while the bus is in motion. So I don't know if that's maybe hand it to a reliable kid to, to hold. I, I don't know. Jeff, you want to say something to that? Uh, basically, I just want to make sure that that is one of the goals using a tablet is to get that software on the tablet to allow that type of bus routing system. Right now, we're testing a tablet purely for allowing the bus drivers to key in their time instead of having to write down manually their time. Mm -hmm. But the next step is to get that software on those tablets to see if that routing software actually works with the tablet. We don't see any reason why it should not. But I mean, we, we know that it works on a tablet. We just haven't put it on ours. Right. Well, it, it, from 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 what I hear from from these experts are that uh, you know if they have a substitute driver, it takes them much longer to make the route than it does a regular driver. And, and I'm thinking that if we had you know with my GPS, you know, it should take my wife the same amount of time that it takes me <laughs> to go from one place to another. But you know it may not. But. We'll, and we'll not share that analogy with her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's all Thank I you, have. Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anybody else? Yes, Mr. Sutter. On number three, the security camera replacement. We originally said this will take two years. Yes, sir. So with the additional two million, how much will that be reduced? The time. Uh -huh. we, we hope by late fall. So from two years down to, what is that, about eight or nine months. So this is the rest of the 2017-18 school year and the fall of the 2018-19 school year? Yes, sir. So we're doing by then. 
are they are they security cameras specifically to deter or to once something is in place to keep it from spreading both how do we use it to deter uh, one the simple presence of cameras is a deterrent secondly it provides an opportunity for people at the school to monitor those cameras as they have time to do to them, personnel that they can assign to do that during the school day uh, the fact that it allows you to rather rapidly determine who did something in a particular situation that's also an effective deterrent so those would be the deterrent features okay thank you that's it yes sir thank you mr Sutter. all right seeing no one else all those in favor aye, aye. opposed madam aye. chair yes um before we move uh i i wanted to read something trusty derek well, Luke. let me let me say that the motion carries okay. sorry my apology motion carries okay can i or can i not Mr. Webb. Well, it, it is after the vote now. Yes. That was my primary concern in terms of board policy, so I'm not necessarily opposed to, to it being read if we have it in hand in accordance with the policy after the vote, but that's also your decision. Okay, so for the information of the rest of the board, um, the board secretary has been asked to read a statement into the record after the vote as to how a vote board member would have voted had he been present to vote um, which i'm going to allow because this will also come up at our regular board meeting at the end of the month and there's no material difference between it being read into the record now and not included in the minutes and the board member raising it at the board meeting where our final vote takes place for general discussion so I'm going to allow the statement to be read. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Derek Lewis, who is absent from the March 13th meeting of the Board of Trustees Committee of the Whole, stated that he, if present, would have voted on the affirmative side of the question dealing with school buses, replacements, and additional school safety investments. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes the administration portion of the agenda. And turn it back over to the board chair. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to um, confirm, according to the policy that Mr. Webb gave us, that that is to be part of the record, but not part of the minutes. Is that correct? Correct. Recorded, okay. but not included in the minutes. All right. Thank you. It's back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next item on our agenda now is buildings and grounds, and I would ask Ms. Leventis Wells to take over that portion of our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, moving right along to building and grounds 4.01, Long Range Facilities Plan Capital Improvement Plan. Uh, Dr. Royster. Thank you, Ms. Leventis Wells. You have uh, both in your packet and today, I think, at your place, a printed copy of the updated long-range facility plan and capital improvement program. I think the items most worthy of note are as follows. One, we're requesting no action on the plan because there are no changes that require action on the part of the board. There are no revisions to the finance portion of the long-range facility plan. There are no changes to projects within the long-range facilities plan as to the opening date, the scheduled construction. So there are no significant financial or facility changes. There are some population updates, obviously, and I think kind of the summary of that is the population appears to be growing in number and at the levels that it has been predicted to do so. Uh, so Ms. Farley has an update that uh, in, in, uh, in recognition of the lateness of the hour and the, uh, the time that uh, we might spend on this, 
I'll ask that she move through that as rapidly as possible, but certainly anything that you have questions about or need clarification on, there would certainly be time and opportunity for that. But I think the, the big news is really those, those, those four things. No, no, no action required, no change to finance, no change to projects, update the population. Ms. Farley? Thank you, Dr. Royster. And that is correct. Uh, as we look at our update this year, uh, projections are on target with what we had said last year. Uh, and, uh, but we will uh, go through the PowerPoint and share with you. Um, the next slide shows um, uh, county population, which is always interesting to look at. Uh, from our standpoint, you know, we're into the statistics a little bit more than some people, but uh, the next slide shows our student population and uh, over this period of time, uh, we've talked a whole lot about births. Nothing has changed there. Births remain low. We continue to mirror the nation. Uh, there's more and more articles that you're seeing about low birth rates. Those large, uh, I'll point you out, in 2014-15, in we had a really long, uh, those few years prior to that, we had really large kindergartens. Ever since then, they've been much lower. And you'll see our projection for the next five years that they may remain lower. Of course, that is matriculating through the elementary grades. Uh, this slide shows you single family building permits in the county. And of course, um, prior to the recession, it was up really high. We are, this six, 17 was almost even with 16 here in the county. This is building permits for single family homes. You'll see that uh, home foreclosures have um, peaked back in uh, 9, 2009 and 10, and that has gradually gotten better, though there are still uh, home foreclosures occurring. In migration, I will take a minute here because I think this is very uh, interesting and it really um, in migration chart, you all have seen this before. Uh, this is data that the planning staff uh, garners from the Census Bureau American Community Survey. And we compare if you see in the 2016, which of course is the last that's available, 2017 will be several months yet before we can uh, secure that data. Red means that it was less than the other years shown. Blue means more. In migration from other states and uh, across the country and South Carolina, this number is reflective of that low birth rate in addition to it just being low birth rate here. But in migration, because look who was in, this is a big number, 25 to 34. I mean, 15 years ago, had we had that type of in migration, there would have been a lot of young people, uh, children in the one to four. So that, that 25 to 34 age group, um, people keep saying who's going into all these apartments and so forth, they are some of them. But very few of them are married and very few of them have children. Uh, this shows you uh, population in the county and the breakdown uh, we look at 2000, the year 2000, and where we are today. And again, this age 50 plus continues to get larger and larger. Uh, that it, it is caused by two things. People who moved here in the 1990s and early 2000s are getting older, and then it has become a great place to retire. This is something you've seen. We've uh, been providing this information for you every year uh, about our transiency. Uh, I know you've all seen that. We also give you what it was the previous year. Um, very transient. Uh, this um, chart shows you um, subdivisions from when our staff did um, growth studies last summer. Uh, subdivisions that have 50 or more lots still to go uh, and you see a lot of dots all over the county and the school district. Uh, the red dots 
came online before June of 2016, and the blue are the newer ones. And you, um, this is multifamily developments. As you know, we've this has been going on now for a few years. We've had a lot of multifamily apartments and condos and so forth uh, coming online. This is a multifamily that's downtown in the city of Greenville. Greenville County Charter Schools, as you know, uh, this year all but Langston uh, left Greenville County Schools and went with the South Carolina Public Charter District. This is the enrollment this year, their enrollment this year. School choice, I'm pleased to tell you that we have increased to 16% of our student population is on school choice. It was 15% last year. Uh, and uh, you'll see um, how those numbers continue to climb. Uh, seats available by zone, that is this year, 17-18, uh, uh, based on our enrollment on the 15th day of school. And if it's a positive number, it means there's space. If there's a negative, it means uh, short some space. This is, uh, reflects our enrollment projections, actual up through 2017, and our projections for the next five years. You will see elementary will dip. That's at lower kindergarten. We are anticipating a lot, a lot of economic development to generate this out here. If that economic development, new businesses and all does not occur, this probably won't occur either. Middle school is going to be increasing, and that's from those very large kindergartners we had back four, five, six years ago. Now they're getting into middle school, and then that'll start leveling and will actually go down when those lower kindergartens get in there. This is high school, same thing. Once those large kindergartens get through middle, they'll start getting into the high school, and then later on that'll drop off some. Seats available by school level. Uh, this is looking at each high school and um, as closely as uh, possible aligned with the elementary, middle, and the seats available. 2022-23 seats available by planning area. Let me just say that this includes the projects that we are, uh, that will be uh, completed over the next five years. That is Fountain Inn High School, the addition onto Summit Drive, and an addition onto Robert E. Cashin. Here again, uh, these are the projects. Of course, you know we're right now, uh, the Rudolph Gordon conversion uh, will open in August. The addition on to Summit Drive, the Fountain Inn High School, and Robert E. Cashin, it, it shows a different color because it, it comes into the next five years because of 2022. And of course, your other. This, show, this chart shows you by uh, elementary school, by zone, uh, the capacity based on our five-year projections at each of the schools. This next is same thing, it's just alphabetic. And then we have the same thing for middle, then this uh, alphabetic, and the same thing for high school and alphabetic. Future projects, and again, as Dr. Royster said, we have made no changes to this. Nothing about the projections uh, has um, caused us to make any recommended changes at this time in the, this is beyond the 2022 uh, time frame. We did add this slide. This is area job announcements in the last two years uh, of 50 or more jobs. Uh, we just thought you might uh, be interested in seeing some of that. We don't include everything. We don't include all the uh, uh, grocery stores and so forth, uh, but um, don't, you might find this in. So, summary, no significant changes have occurred to cause us to um, change any of our facilities or, uh, and like I mentioned, in migration of millennials remains strong as well as increasing that 50 plus population. And uh, so, one thing that can and we will continue to monitor uh, new charter schools uh, coming online can certainly impact us uh, as well as changes in the e economy here. 
Uh, so we are making no recommended changes and presenting this for your information. Be glad to answer any questions. Dr. Bowen Connor. Thank you. I just wonder um, if you could answer, and you probably did, but it's it's moving quickly, which I appreciate, but I might have misunderstood, and I, I need to understand something about Fountain Inn. Um, it is just my impression and understanding from living down in that area and having the appearance of growth that is still very strong all the time down in that area. I just want to be sure that we are not going to regret building the school the size it is if the growth is outpacing in any way what we were expecting. But it sounds like you're saying even though we're showing a 165 seats short in for high school seats there, I guess because of Hillcrest being overcrowded and so on, are we still comfortable and maybe Mr. Mills and you together that we're we're choosing the right size based on any growth changes we've seen in the last year. Well, I would certainly say that uh, the in initially placing the plan in the Long Range uh, Fountain Inn High School in the Long Range Facility Plan for a thousand stu students to be easily expanded to two thousand would allow for any changes we see down the road. Now, there is growth occurring all over this district in new housing. But I need to explain that we are not seeing the same student yield that we were seeing. That student yield is not as strong as it was. In other words, when 100 new homes are being built, we're not seeing as many new elementary, middle, and high school students coming to us. And I think some of the things that are causing that are Millennials buying houses that are not married or just getting married or as one article said, they're buying houses because of their pets. I mean, I, I and <laughs> there is an article out there I can share it with you it's about true. that. It's true. Uh, and the retirees that are right. moving here okay. are buying those houses. Just anecdotally, uh, personally, we know about four couples, more my age, who have recently moved here from across the country because they wanted, they think it's a great place to live. So They're right. <laughs> and it is. I agree. Okay. So, but we, we will continue to monitor that carefully. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Anyone else? Yes. Is Michelle Goodwin. Oh, well, your question. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the seats available on the elementary schools. The ones that um, have a negative um, in them, what are you going to be doing at those schools to, to accommodate looking at the seats available? Well, like we I see that a lot of them, a couple of them have um, seats available. I mean, not seats available. They're at a right. negative. Right. Well, we have uh, a couple of things that are going on. Uh, last year, uh, we recommended and the board approved, we're going to be conducting a facility study that is going to be looking at some specific schools. Uh, one of those is Alexander, one is Welcome, and we're going to be looking uh, with that facility study. That's an extensive facility study of the building itself. Uh, there's uh, five or six schools uh, that's in that study. So that, that is recognizing some of that for that purpose. Additionally, uh, I mentioned that we are going to be adding on to Summit Drive uh, and that sets um, in the n north of the city uh, located between Lake Forest and Cherrydale uh, in that area and then of course uh, 
the addition onto Robert E. Cashin, which is just south uh, of, um, I think, uh, Grove, May I'm looking for Grove, um, and some of that area in there, in Zone 5. Cashin is in Zone 5 uh, for addition. So those things are um, in process to help with that. Additionally, we have uh, in the long range plan, now it's after the five years, a new elementary school on the site of the old jail man. And as you know, sometimes when we build new schools or add on to schools, uh, the student assignment may involve several schools. At that but time. I see a couple of those schools on the west side that are at a negative. What are you going to do with those for those? Um, especially, I'm, I'm looking at Cherrydale because I know I came from Cherrydale, and that's a small campus. And if they are already at a negative, what are you going to do there? Will you well, be adding well, portables me, or? Well, we have whatever. a couple of portables at Cherrydale. Now, let me tell you that what caused that increase was uh, the construction. Uh, the most significant thing that caused the increase was the construction of those apartments, uh, a, those apartments which uh, that you know that's stabilized now. Their population's been stabilized the last two or three years, pretty much. But again, when we add on to Summit Drive, depending on what method we use, we. When we add on to a school like that, sometimes we help relieve other schools, and that's what I'm saying. Like Forest is to the right of Summit Drive, and Cherrydale is to the left. If you're looking, so at you'll it. be redrawing lines. We for, might, for or we might use, zones. we might uh, redraw lines, or possibly cho some specific choice targeting those two schools to go there, or something like that. Uh, we all and. Uh, like I said, we have the study, uh, the long run, the facility study that we're going to be uh, doing that I know includes Alexander and Welcome. Okay, and I wanted to ask you about the um, the one that you have about the births. Um, going back five years to see what uh, what are we at right now. I know we had, we're we at a negative 423 in 15-16, so 16-17 we had 131, which was uh, addition, right? Because um. you said that you're looking at it for, um, this is birth to five years, and then you look five years down the road to see what, um, how, um, how many kids will be coming into the schools for the growth, right? Yes. Um, it's back. I don't, okay. know, I don't know what number it is. That yeah, one there, right there. There it is. Uh, see, um, in 2015-16, uh, and we had predicted this because births five years earlier uh, were a lot lower here. They were also a lot lower nationwide, and that has made, and we dropped 423 students. And if you really look, we're nowhere close. That 2017-18, 5,568, we're nowhere close back to that 5,925 in 14-15, or that 58-73. And if you went on backwards, it was still high. And see, as those gray, as those um, kindergartens move through, in other words, that drop that 5,502, that class is in second grade now. So we really have kindergarten, first, and second grade that is at a low, is lower than it has been for a long time district-wide. Now there might be a school here or there that is seeing a little different picture based on the demographics of the school. But as those uh, grades move through the population. See, uh, that set, that that's in second grade now, in, in uh, four years will be in sixth grade. So that's what I was talking about. 
behind it is are these larger grades <coughs> that are going to be mo that are moving into middle school right now right and then you'll have these lower grades coming behind there and then we have the bursts the bursts you see for 18 that's related to 18 19 19 20 mm -hmm. 20 21 and so forth those are the bursts that we have uh, we get that from uh, DHEC they track births uh, mm -hmm. by county of residents uh, we secure that information from them and you see the births um, continue to be low in comparison to that 67 and 65 hundred so we're only planning for one elementary school on the old jail man property right um, and an at, at, at addition what, this is in the next well uh, there are other additions in in addition in the next five years we're going to be adding on to summit drive elementary and robert e cashin elementary uh, mr costin please go to the slide that shows the uh, projects after 2022 for those that did you, i should have introduced mr costin and helping me today he's a demographic analyst in the planning department these are the projects that are in the long range facility plan that you all have already approved that are beyond the next five years and um there are uh, additions other than a uh, new north area middle school and the new elementary school i saw on the old jail man site now at the bottom is listed uh the schools that are going to be uh, looked at carefully in that facility study that i mentioned it lists all of them uh, alexander elementary welcome elementary bryson middle hughes middle northwest middle the uh, career and technical programs and career centers and also as a part of that possibly uh, fountain end uh, elementary what about cherrydale you don't have that in there no why because the facility study is to look at the if you will look at all the schools listed there they are older facilities to be looked at as to uh, what to look at their structural and their um, I thought that all of the facilities were in the best program so um, you're saying they're no. older facilities now there were the best program was 70 schools but we had other schools that were done prior to that who were not impacted by the best program so these are some of those, schools. those yes yes ma'am okay okay any other questions that's all my questions for Thank right you. now anyone else okay thank you um this was information only there does not need a motion so we thank you Ms. Farley thank you both um, and we will move to 4.02 facilities project report Dr. Royster thank you Ms. Venice Wells Mr. Mills is here I don't know if he has any specific information to excuse me to share with you but he'll answer any question you have Mr. Mills Good afternoon. I'm here to answer any questions. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Mills? <clears throat> Mr. Mills, you did such a great job. Oh, wait a minute. There is a question. Not that good of a job. Uh. <laughs> Should have leapt from your seat as soon as she said that. <laughs> trying, to my come, apologies. Trying, to, trying to turn my microphone off. Stay where you are. It may, it may rather be that Mr. Meek just doesn't understand you. <laughs> I think, I think he's very knowledgeable and we will ask for your question at this time Mr. <laughs> thank you yes sir the project down at uh, Woodmont High School for the um, agriculture whatever they had there are you referring to the screening yeah is that completed yes sir it is and and uh, our mutual friend is uh, gave you compliments that you probably did the best you could with what you had to do with <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Is that, is that a question or uh, uh, that, that, that's just his word i just want to see if it was finished that's all we're going to do right yes sir it's, it's completed okay that is it thank you 
Thank you, Mr. Meeks. Anyone else? You did such a good job. <laughs> Thank you. There is no uh, motion needed because this was information only. So therefore, we will move to 4.03, declaration of approximately 2.4 acres of M.T. Anderson Support Center as surplus property. Dr. Royster. Thank you, Ms. Levin, as well. Uh, as sometimes happens uh, over time, I can't, I think probably the last time this happened was a piece of property over near Blythe. It's happened a few times in the last uh, 10 years or so that I've been here. Uh, We'll have a person approach us and they have some desire or reason to buy a portion or all of a piece of property that we have. And if the property is not already declared surplus, then we look at the request that that individual or entity has made to determine if in fact we actually have future use for the property. So you have in front of you a request to make a portion of the property at M.T. Anderson available for sale as surplus to our needs. It's been examined not only by Mr. Mills and his staff, but he got input from, uh, although it's on the property at M.T. Anderson, it directly impacts, or could, impact the athletic facilities of Southside High School, which are located on that property. After assessing the property and meeting with them, uh, we find that the property doesn't have any future use to us. If there were expansions that we would do of the fields on that property, there are other areas there that we would use as opposed to the piece of property in question due to the topography and the elevation drop in that piece of property. We need to look to other parts of that campus or to the south side campus itself. So we, we have determined based on our analysis that our recommendation to you would be to, to surplus this piece of property. Now when we do that, we still follow the same process we do for any other piece of surplus property. We do not simply recommend its sale to the person who uh, expressed interest in it. We put it on the market using our process to put an appropriate value on it. We offer it for sale to whoever wishes to enter an offer on it and then we bring that offer back to the board and you all either approve or reject that offer once you've approved it, if you choose to do so, as, surp as property surplus to the needs of the district. So that, I, I think that summarizes the entire thing. Mr. Mills, did I leave anything out? No, sir, I think you're correct. Okay, so are there any questions? Mr. Meek. If, <clears throat> if I'm looking at the... Uh, attachment to this where it's got the 2.00 acres in an L shaped is that the property that we're talking about y yes sir uh, what's on the screen now okay yes yes sir what's outlined in blue is the proposed property it would be surplus okay and I and I cannot see it but it, but I swear it looks like that uh, part of that baseball diamond is is under that line it, it is it is the angle in which this aerial photograph was taken um, actually we intend to leave a portion of the back uh, of this property uh, in trees and, and when we survey the property we're going to leave about 10 or 15 feet set back on our property to the property line for this proposed sale okay and, and also for this it, does the property drop off Yes, sir. There's a, there's a, a rather steep drop from um, the tree line there uh, along the first baseline in the outfield. Mm -hmm. They are down to uh, Blasting Game Road. It's probably about 40 feet in elevation change across there. If you've ever been to M.T. Anderson, you'll see the parking lot on, uh, on the extreme right of this photograph. It mimics the elevation change across that parking lot. Okay. Now, the... To the left of the two point oh or is that all the district owns is that we we own we own what you see outlined there in a white outline it looks like a flag lot wait a minute wait a minute what, what are you talking about there uh, let me get a pointer okay Oh, you're up here. 
white alpine right here. Okay. That's a flag lot. The district owns this piece of property and the district owns this piece of property. This piece right here is part of the greater uh, M.T. Anderson Southside High School Athletic Fields property. This piece right here is only this flag lot right here is also belongs to the district. This piece here, this parcel, this parcel, this and these three parcels are all privately owned. Okay. Go Say back. that one more time. Yeah. You see this white outline right yes. here? Yes. Yes. It goes back in. That's a flag lot. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's shaped like a flag. It's not a. It's not a. No, no, because there are lots of white lines there. It's not an acronym like all those others we've used today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just what it says. I, I didn't know it. Coming across this way, coming back down to this corner, going back over that corner, and coming back down to Blasting Gate. It's kind of like shaped like the state of Oklahoma. Turned up yeah, state. I was going to say it looks but that's a like a state. That, that, that belongs to the school district. That flag is not right there. This other portion of the property that we're proposing is this, this rectangle right here. It's also district property. And it's part of a larger piece of property that M.T. Anderson and Athletic Fields and all set up. Okay, the, the other lots. Do they have no, that, that we do not own? Do, do they have houses on? Uh, yeah, those. This lot right here has a house on it. This lot has a demolished one moment. It's, it's still in ruins. It's back here. There's a residence right here. I believe this is vacant. Um, and I believe this is vacant lot. But I think this is all one piece, one under right here. And I do not usually ask this, Terry. Do we have any idea what someone may be proposing to put there? Um, it's, it's my understanding that it's, it's for the residents and all this property is some residential. Sing, single family residential too? Single family residential. Okay, so, so in, in all of what we're looking at there are, are, are north of Blass and Game Road there next to the ball field is two houses are on it. Uh, is that yes, right? Sir, I believe there's a house here and a house there. And the rest are vacant lots. Uh, yes, sir. At this time. Mm -hmm. The people, the person that is interested that brought this to our attention, do they own the other two houses? No, sir. Do they have options to buy on the other two or anything you don't know? I can't speak to that. Yeah. See, it just looks to me like it's a uh, a plan, and I'm not sure what the plan would be to put something else there if they can obtain the other property. You know, and I know that single family, but you know, they do get these rezoned. If there's yeah. enough interest there and enough, yeah. uh, from from what you're saying, though, the property is not. Of course, you know what we may not want to do with it. Somebody else with a little uh, ingenuity and thinking ahead may want to do something with it and could build up that property. Um, I'm hesitant for us to sell that not knowing exactly mm -hmm. what what what's in store for the school down there. I, I would hate for something to start coming up out of the ground that would be uh, I don't know something something I, I don't even can't even imagine what it might be if it's some type of industrial product or industrial place or whatever. How, how many acres total is that, Terry? That's two that we have. I was going to say the whole whole little area. How many? Yeah, probably six. I think we're probably Okay. On the left side of the property that where the house is, where the vacant property, do we own on the other side of that? Yes, sir. We own all these trees. And what use do we have for that? 
we don't have any prescribed use for it. It's just vacant land now. Um, but they're not interested in that. No, sir. No, they haven't expressed an interest in it. No. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Yes, sir. Anyone else? This good one, Carla. Um, in in speaking with you, Terry, and with Dr. Royster, I had some questions about that too, about the use of that property. Um, and if it would be detrimental to that community or to Southside High School with it being backing up to the baseball um, field and the practice field. Um, I still have some questions. Um, so can I make a motion or, or this is just time for, I would like to make a motion. Um, I would like to make a motion that we um, postpone this item until the April um, 2018 Cal meeting um, because I have some questions about that and and I, I want to get a feel whether that is good for that community and for Southside High School. Thank you. I'm finished. Thank you. Um, so. Mr. Suddeth, you have questions? What's the assessed value of those two acres? We've got a we've got a comp on it. Uh, yes, sir. We the um, we had a our, our broker our real estate broker doing a, a broker's attenuation of value and thirty five thousand five hundred dollars per acre. Are, Seventy one thousand dollars. Yes, sir. That's all those two acres are worth. I'm sorry, sir. That's yes, sir. All those are worth. It's, un, it's undeveloped. I mean, it's obviously it's undeveloped property. It's not of the greatest. I mean, the problem we have with it is the the change, the, rap, the great change in elevation on it. But it's zoned what? Residential. Uh, single family residences. So to change that would require, who would have to change it? They would have to go in front of the, I believe this property is in the city or the county. The the county. county. It, it would have to go in front of the county zoning. Mr. Sutter, we're going to extend for 10 minutes without objection. Thank you. So if we sell it for seventy one thousand and then if someone comes in and says they don't want to make that continue to be um, zoned as it is, they want to change the zoning on it. So that would be up to the county council? Uh, yes, sir, it would be up to county zoning. Zoning first and then I think if they don't, if they wish to appeal that decision, they can appeal that to the county council. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? I have a, I just have a statement. I'm going to have to, can I make a statement? Okay, good. I'm going to have to agree with Mr. Meek and Ms. Goodwill, uh, Goodman Caldwell because I have a concern about selling off property. I mean, to me, that's going to be landlocked area if Southside decides to build any additional anything. And um, I just have some concerns. So I, I'm going to favor um, the motion to do a little more research as well. But at this time, if there are no more, dis there's a discussion. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Was, okay. Did, did I see you before? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Grayson? I just, the discussion has, has lent itself to a question, which is what could be built on that L shaped piece of property that could benefit Southside? If it's the backside of a baseball field, could we expand it to, I mean, would we build anything on it? Would we expand an athletic field? Would we make down the trees? I mean, what has the administration 
what analysis has the administration given to declaring it surplus in the first place? Because I thought a prerequisite of declaring something surplus is we can't use it. You know, as part of the assessment that takes place, and they, these things happen on occasion, someone comes to us and says, would you sell us this piece of property? It's not already declared surplus. Then we try to assess that piece of property from any potential future use. And when uh, Mr. Mills and his staff did that, in conjunction with Southside administration, athletic director, whoever else they involved there, in essence, we don't have a future use for this piece of property. So perhaps to address some of the concerns around that, if we, if we determine we have property that we do not have a reasonable future use for it, it is in the best interest of the district, in most cases, to surplus the property and sell it, because we're simply, to whatever degree we maintain it, we're having to maintain it, and whatever liability comes with owning property that you don't have any future use for. So we go through that any time we think about surplus in a piece of property, we look at it, any future use, is it in the best interest of the district to keep it, or would we be better off to reduce the size of our holdings and get rid of the piece of property? In this case, in weighing those things, our recommendation is we don't have a future use for it. Now, I understand there might be concerns about what people, what people ultimately do with that piece of property. And all we can tell you is the uh, individual that approached us expressed a desire for a residential use. I, I thought was to add to a house that's already there, but didn't perhaps to build a new house. That's correct. Okay. Okay, so if I understand the administration correctly, this decision was made in conjunction with the current administration at Southside High School who would have a sense of whether or not the property could be used on the local level. In other words, it wasn't the administration going up to the Southside principal and saying, you don't have a use for this property. He sat down with the, with the local administrator and said, how could you use this property if we held on to it? I mean, I just want to get a sense for the conversation. The we reached out to the principal athletic director and uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Daryl reached Nance. out to Daryl Nance reached out to them had had an uh, extended conversation with the athletic director about it. They determined there was no future use as far as athletic concerns are for that piece of property. The principal was approached also. We uh, had conversations were held on site. Uh, with the uh, fields and grounds, Mr. Shane Wyndham, to look at the property also. He, there was no determination that he had no future needs or uses for the property. Also, as has been stated earlier, there's approximately 35 to 40 foot of elevation change in this property from the back property line out to Blast and Game uh, Street. It would be very hard for us to, to do anything with this piece of property. We couldn't make a level playing field out of it, and it's really too steep for us to use for access from ADA, parking, or anything that was practical for, for the, the uh, piece of property there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Yes, ma'am. That's all. <clears throat> is the property listed for sale? No, sir, it is not. Do we have a buyer for the property? Uh, we have some uh, individuals expressed an interest. But we would not recommend to you selling to a buyer without going through the process of advertising it for sale so that anyone in the general public that's interested in purchasing that property has the opportunity to do so. That's the process we've followed in the past with these type of situations. And we, we explained that to the individual who contacted us as That's well. correct. So we don't have it listed for sale, Dr. Roster. Someone just came up and said we'd like to buy it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Chapman's on occasion. All right. If we got a board member who wants to po po postpone it, then I see no reason to po not to postpone it. Since they're just throwing interest, though, they're not looking to do something with it right now, are they? Or we wouldn't know that, would they? No, sir, we don't, we don't really know that. We, the administration has no compelling reason to ask you to do it today or to do it in April. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any Anyone else? All right. So the motion on the floor, Sherry, would you please read it? To postpone until April County. Okay. So that's the motion. Uh, Roll call. Repeat that for me before we roll call, please. Yes, sir. I didn't quite get it. The motion on the floor is to.
postpone okay. the Thank vote you. until April count and bring it back to the agenda. Right. No, but I was told you should always ask for roll call at board training. Um, so we will have roll call. Mrs. Bush? Yes. Mrs. goodwin Cowwile. Yes. Mrs. Grayson? No. Mrs. Leventis Wells? Yes. Mr. Meek? Yes. Mrs. Morrison Fair? Yes. Mrs. Rowletter? No. Mr. Sutton? Yes. Dr. O'Connor? Yes. Seven yes, two no. Okay, so the motion passes to bring this back in April. Dr. O'Connor, with uh, the completion of 4.03, I will now turn this back to you. Thank you very much to all of you who ably managed the Committee of the Whole Agenda today. Um, I would like to remind everyone that our class size workshop will start immediately after the cow in conference room A. Um, and I will accept a, an adjournment motion. A motion to adjourn. Have a motion. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. And the motion carries. Thank you. We will move across to A.